Hi, I'm Steve Thompson. I'm president of Emory Thompson Machine, and welcome to Make It Fresh, where we're going to try to teach you how to make uh, Italian ices, ice cream, uh, ice cream of any air content from uh, the heaviest ice creams uh, like custard all the way on up to uh, homemade ice cream, uh, sorbet, sorbetto, uh, gelato, frozen lemonade, just about anything that can be produced, we are making videos for to show you how to do it because we want to see you get into business. This is Jeff Markow. Uh, Jeff is otherwise known as Tie Dye Jeff. Nobody knows him any other way. And he is from Fruit Loops, Florida. And the business is called uh, Mystic Ices and Ice Cream. And uh, Jeff's business, if you haven't been there, is one of a kind, and you've got to stop by sometime and see it. So we're going to get going. I'm going to start today with a flavor that I've never made uh, in 324 videos because it's my favorite flavor, and I just know if I make it, I'm going to eat it all. Uh, so uh, I'm going to risk it, and we're going to make it anyway. So I've come up with a recipe that I'll pass out to you. And if you'll pass those around, you'll see one thing's crossed out in my enthusiasm to type up these formulas. I added uh, Philadelphia cream cheese to the recipe, and that doesn't work in mint chip. That goes to another recipe later. <laughs> um, but we're going to use um, the blend of ice cream. Would you mind telling them what the ice cream mix is while I go get the bag? Sure. What's in it? Sure. <laughs> I'm waiting. Okay. Uh, you know, what? when we refer to mix, it's what... Uh, oh, he's going to get it. It's uh, what we get from the dairies to make the, the ice cream base is a better word for it. But everybody in the industry calls it mix. It's a, a blend of uh, skim milk, cream, regular milk and sugar. sugar, and, milk. and what? Regular milk. Skim. Regular milk, right. I don't really know. <laughs> I, I don't really do. know. It's milk, cream, sugar, skim milk. And there's something called milk solids. Yes. What's that? Uh, milk solids is the good stuff that's in cream. If you take away uh, the all the fat out of cream, uh, you're left with just skim milk. And so skim milk is very high in milk solids, but very low in fat. So it's a way of increasing uh, the good stuff that's in ice cream without raising the fat. What percent of that bag would you say is cream? Oh, well, let's see. This has started off coming out of the cow at about 39%, and we're going to run it down to 10%. So somebody well, out there... No, that's the fat. That's the fat. What so, percent would be cream? Well, that's what I'm saying is we're going we're gonna to cut the cream uh, by adding milk uh, and cut sugar. Cut the cream, huh? <laughs> so, in other words, I don't know. No, I don't know either. All right. I call in my store, I call it, there's a bags of cream. Yeah. That works. So we're going to start. We're getting off to an auspicious start. Oh, we'll be fine. We're going to start by um, sanitizing the machine. Haven't used it in a few weeks, and I want to kill off any bacteria that might be in the machine. And so I'm going to start that process by using a product that I like called Sterachine. Now, I'm not here to shill other people's products. What I am here to do is to tell you what works so that uh, when you're using it, you'll know that there's no problem with it with the health department or anywhere else. These are things that they approve. Sterachine and all sanitizers are basically chlorine. Um, it's uh, like Clorox bleach. Uh, chlorine kills bacteria. But if you have a jug of chlorine around in your store, there's two dangers. One is the jug of Clorox looks just like something they use in Italian ices sometimes called citric acid. And I don't want to wake up at 2 in the morning and say, now, did I put citric acid in the lemon ice or did I put Clorox bleach? So if you're going to use Clorox, use it and then put it outside the room like any other chemical. A safer way is to use a product like Sterachine. This is a new device. That's our, uh, you had to line them both up. Beautiful. New adjustable shelves on all the machines. I don't have that. You don't. You'll have to I buy a new machine. It. You'll have to buy a new machine. I want so I'm going to put a little bit of this sanitizer in water, and uh, this will kill off any bacteria in the machine. And there are directions that you can read and follow and know exactly how much water and how much sanitizer to use, but I'm not good at following directions, so um, I just kind of guess at it. But I'm not going to use a whole lot. It's, it's uh, very potent. And I need a spatula. Here we go. We got lots of those. 
And this is all just to kill the bacteria off. And I'll show you the insides of the machine while this is uh, sanitizing. A little trick I learned from Jeff, you can squeeze these containers to make your own funnel. Make sure the gate is closed. Um, because otherwise the water is going all over the floor. Okay, so there's just water and sanitizer in there. And I'm going to go to the Infinite Overrun and I'm going to pick uh, a product, I'll say homemade, and start. Now it's going to spin at maximum speed and distribute that product uh, all the way around. And we'll let that go for a minute or so. Um, this is what's inside the machine. This, this machine makes one full tub at one time. So that's the dasher that's inside there. Uh, it's all stainless steel. These are Delrin blades. They're the only plastic I'm aware of that is uh, FDA approved for food machines. And our unique design that since it's spring loaded, as the blades wear over the next five years, because you don't have to change them for five or six years, um, they'll still push against the blade, uh, the walls as if they were brand new. This is the 24. You can see it's twice the size. And we make a 12, 24, 44, and then the smaller machines. Um, not to make a cheap sales pitch, but the price difference between this machine and this one is only $2,000. So in your future plans, this one might not even make sense. Jeff uses this one uh, because for $2,000, you're either cutting your labor in half by making twice as much, or you're cutting your freezing time in half because they both run in eight minutes, but this one's going to make two tubs. So I'll pass these around. You can see I have a, a two bars of stainless steel on there just to hold the blades from going flying. So I'll pass these around, but if I hear a whoops, don't worry about it. I know that you took the plastic uh, safety bars off and they went flying. But that's the uh, 24. Grab it by the stainless steel. There you go. And it'll give you an idea of the weight and strength of these machines. So this is now sanitized. When we make ice cream today, you're going to see us turn off the refrigeration switch and keep it spinning. That's to push the ice cream out. Uh, ice cream is thick at that point and it's going to flow out very nicely. Right now, it's just water in there. And if I open this, the front row is going to get a bath like Shamu the Whale at SeaWorld uh, because the water will come flying out because it's so loose. So turn off the water, turn off the spinning, and just drain that out. Could I have another, about that much of just clean water? Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to keep this water. This is sterile water, and I'm going to put my spatulas in it, and I'm going to keep it off to the side because anything that's going to come in contact with my, the ice cream, my hands, I can just go like that, and now my hands are more clean than they were. They're sanitized. Uh, notice the gate is open. You're going to do this sometime. You're going to be pouring dairy product into the machine or Italian ice, and it's going to go all over the floor, and you're going to use curse words about me that uh, nobody's ever heard before because the machine is leaking, and it's not leaking. The fact is the gate is still open, so close the gate. And I'll just set this aside over here so that when I need a sterile spatula, I've got one ready to go. And um, I'm just going to run... That's good. I'm just going to run a short rinse through this because I did not measure how much sterosine I used. If you read and follow the directions properly, you don't have to rinse afterwards. Uh, but I just want to make sure there's no residue in there. You don't want to your core no, I don't. And, and when we build the machine, when it's on level ground, uh, we have built a slight pitch into the barrel. Thank you. We've built a slight pitch into the barrel so that it's going to drain everything out completely. And that just does a slosh around for a second or two. Thanks. Again, turn off the infinite overrun control. Drain it out. Now, if we don't open this door and um, you know put our hands in there, we can make ice cream now for the next 20 hours if you wanted to. 
if we're going to take an hour break for lunch, I would re-sanitize. But other than that, you can just go batch after batch after batch, theoretically, if you wanted to. Yes? Do you clean it in between batches? Like, if you make chocolate and then you go to strawberry? Okay. We don't have a microphone in the audience yet, which we will be getting by August. Uh, so I'm going to repeat the question. And that is, do you have to clean between flavors? What you do is you plan your production so that you start off with a light flavor and work down. And you're never going to make just one batch of something. You're not going to do all this prep to say, OK, I'm going to make a batch of vanilla today. You're probably going to make three, four, five batches of vanilla. So uh, think about it logically. Uh, I'm running vanilla in the machine. And then it's going to come out. So nothing else is in the machine but vanilla. So if I want to make, say, butterscotch swirl, uh, butterscotch swirl is vanilla ice cream. And Jeff's going to show you a technique. He's adding butterscotch as it comes out. So the finished product is butterscotch swirl, but he's never contaminated the machine. And so you can do butterscotch swirl. You can do cherry swirl. You can do all these different things. And you've never contaminated the machine. I'll get to you in a sec. Next thing will be. Fruit flavors, you said strawberry. So I'll make strawberry. Now I've, content I've put half my strawberries in here and the other half as it's coming out. That's my technique. And um, I've now contaminated the machine with strawberry. So after strawberry, it discharges virtually uh, almost everything. But you are going to have a coating of some ice cream on some of the parts. So I've got some strawberry in there. So maybe next I'll make red raspberry. They're both berries. The red raspberry is a little bit darker. So if a tiny bit of strawberry gets into the red raspberry, you'll never notice. From there, I can make Bordeaux cherry, uh, and, which is darker. And then I can go to black raspberry. So I've made all those flavors without having to rinse the machine. If I start with chocolate and then go to vanilla, uh, now I've got to rinse the whole machine out, which well, is only going to take me two or three quick rinses, maybe four minutes at the most. Well, Five minutes. Well. Go ahead. I, we disagree on, on rinsing the machine. <laughs> OK. I think I go by ingredients, not by color of the mix. Um, I don't want errant chocolate chips falling into an ice cream that uh, doesn't have chocolate chips. But as far as chocolate and vanilla, I have no problem making chocolate and then going to um, a white flavor, chocolate chip or, or whatever, because the amount that's left these machines, are, I'm not selling his machines, but they're so efficient that you get like 95, 98% of the stuff out of it. So if you think about 10 quarts of mix going into the machine and a, a cup of chocolate that's still in there, you, you don't even see it. But if I went from vanilla to, cho or from cho or from vanilla to chocolate, then it would be 100% clean. Well, of course, you'd go from vanilla to chocolate, but there's nothing wrong with going from chocolate to strawberry. Okay, that's good to know. You had a question. What about fat content buildup on the barrel? What content? What building up? Fat content. The question is, uh, what about fat content building up on the barrel? Uh, assuming that your mix is uh, pasteurized and homogenized, you're not going to get any fat buildup uh, on the walls in any batch freezer, whether it's mine or a Capigiani uh, or some Chinese machine. And also, uh, they're scraping. Uh, yeah, it's, incredible. It's, it's scraping off the wall. So, no, you won't get a fat buildup. If you have a, a, a raw ice cream mix, which has uh, not been homogenized. Homogenization is when you take uh, the cream out of the cow and you ram it through a series of screen doors. And each one is a little bit finer. And so it breaks down the fat globules. As long as your product, and that's the way it comes from a dairy, if that's been done, you're never going to have a fat buildup of any kind. Uh, using raw uh, dairy, yes, you'll get little balls of fat at the higher speeds. Um, but no, that's, that's a non-starter. That's not a problem. So let me put some dairy product in here. Uh, the recipe calls for five quarts of mix. And this term mix is an awful term. It's a blend. Uh, the cow was milked at 4 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Uh, the milk was, the dairy product was collected and brought over to the dairy, uh, the processing plant. And they literally separate it. They use a machine called a separator. And they separate it into uh, cream, whole milk, low-fat milk, and skim milk. And then the dairy re-blends it uh, so that um, 
it is then this a certain percentage of fat, the one that you want to buy. Did I do it okay? Or? You did a beautiful oh. job. <laughs> Years of experience. Make sure the gate's closed. I like to flip up the safety guard. So I'm going to put this in. And I like to have something underneath here at all times. And I'm blind in one eye, and I never spill. <laughs> Except today. <laughs> now, the trick is so you don't spill. Don't rest your container on the lid. Raise it up a little bit, and then you won't spill. Okay, that's my dairy. Um, hmm. You know what? I'm going to use uh, this natural mint flavor. This is a company called Green Mountain Flavors. Stan Sitton is the president. And Green Mountain Flavors uh, has developed all natural uh, colors and ingredients. Uh, when, uh, back in the Stone Age, when Jeff and I were growing up, uh, we used Red Dye 40, Yellow 17, Green 6. These are all pure chemicals. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, the people here in this audience, compared to uh, the millennials coming along today, they're far more savvy than we were about what they're eating. You know, we're the ones who invented this three-second rule. You know, if it drops on the ground, you got three seconds to get it. Uh, they, they just wouldn't do that. Uh, so a mother walks in, and, and sometimes it's perceived notion. Um, you know, the, uh, what's the word? The optics of it. Mother walks in, she's in her 30s, and she's got a two-year-old in the stroller, and there is a blood-red cherry Italian ice, or if you look at the videos, my Sharknado Italian ice, and she won't buy it because she knows that's red dye 40, and I'm not going to give my child red dye 40. Oh, no, ma'am, that's not red dye 40. That's... Um, that is a red dye made from concentrated beets. Beets are the reddest thing in nature. And uh, this company, uh, Green Mountain Flavors, condenses down the beets, gets rid of the taste, the flavor, and makes a, a red color that is absolutely beautiful, but it's all natural. And when you explain that to the, the customer and say, oh, no, no, that's made from beet juice, well, you've just won them over forever because it, it just puts a shine on your whole business that says, wow, they really do care about it, right down to the, the food coloring. So Jeff said, I don't need color today uh, for my mint chip, but I, I just can't see eating mint chip without uh, green color. And the way he does it here, maybe someone in the audience can pronounce this. It's S-P-I-R-U-L-I-N-A. It looks like spirulina. Is it? Okay. Spirulina extract, whatever he said. And uh, this is all from plants. So this is an all-natural color. I think that's really exciting because I do like colors. Um, I made one mistake. I'm going to take a little bit of mix out and, because the concentrated um, mint flavor is so strong that I don't want to waste it pouring it into the machine and just having a little bit of this concentrate just on the metal. Um, I'll take that. Oh, you're going to mix use that. I'm going to just use this to mix it. So it calls for three teaspoons of the emulsion. And let me just shake it. It doesn't say you have to shake it, but let's do it. Taking a walk on the wild side. You bet. New flavor for me. <laughs> okay, it's as thick as molasses. There's one. No, that wasn't one. It wasn't? It wasn't no, enough? No, that was a half. Okay, then we'll go for more. Two. Jeff is really big on flavor. Three. A little more? I think so. All right, a whole other one? No, that's good. That's good? But you got to now mix it in there so it... Yeah, okay. I know you can't see this, but there really isn't a lot to see. I'm just... It's beige. <laughs> And now it's going to be green, right? Mm -hmm. Really green. Really green. So let's put the green in, too. How much green? Um, three ounces. So let's try a little less. Do you have an ounce container over on the right there? Yes. Three ounces. Let me move this. Okay. Boy, this is thick stuff. Yeah. <laughs> three. You'll never get it out of there. 
Why don't we estimate it? It's only color. Uh, it's pretty strong. Let's. I can estimate. Oh, you mean you can't get it You'll out of there? You'll never get it out of there. Uh, six tablespoons. Okay. You want to do it? Sure. Okay. One. Two. See, Jeff, you're going to find out, makes uh, three tried and true recipes that he knows are going to come out. When I do these classes, I experiment. I, I always do things I've never done before. That's because why we have this. Yeah. <laughs> Let's try five. Um, it calls for six, though, right? Don't worry, though. It's only color. Well, let's just see how this looks in this little bit. See, it's not going to be very much color. No, I add a little more. All right. Oh, look at you going hog wild now. How the times are a-changing, Yes, huh? they are. Okay, let's get this show going. It's going to be very pale. Well, then that'll be nice. We'll have a compromise. And the result, I mean, when you have Jeff's ice cream, it's going to be absolutely perfect. With the result of mine, you're going to say, you know, that was good, but maybe you should have added a little more green or maybe a little of the extra. And then you adjust your formula. Uh, I get people calling up and they want to buy uh, one of the smaller machines and they're going to experiment for the next year. And it just, you know, I, it just used to drive me crazy. Now, uh, you know, because I'm not a great salesman, uh, I, I realize, fine, great, buy the machine, experiment for a year. It's really not the right answer. The right answer is just get yourself in business. Uh, it's not going to take you more than three recipes to come up with the perfect flavor. Well, so Why don't we uh, put a little in here and smoosh it around? Put all right. Okay. Let me turn this on and get it smushed around. Smushed around? Yeah. Now, as soon as I move this, there's nothing catching the dripping. Well, that's what the towel's for. No. Come on. There was a one-quart container somewhere. Right there. That's right. good. Perfect. There you go. We're supposed to make this look easy. Any questions so far? I know I'm confused. So, uh, so, so far, everything is all natural. Right down there. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, is the Green Mountain flavor based out of Vermont? Very good question. No, they're no. in Oswego, Illinois. Yes. Who knows where it's Oswego is? I don't. But no, you would think with a name like Green Mountain. Okay. Now, I'm gonna, let me just show you about the uh, infinite overrun control. This is something I invented 14 years ago. And um, we have sold... <laughs> Every machine that we make now uh, has had it uh, for the last 14 years. Um, on it, mm. I can, I can uh, make any product in the world because the only difference between, besides fat content or ingredients is the air content. So if you, take, um, if you had a bowl and you poured some heavy cream in it and you stir it really fast with your hand, it's still going to remain heavy cream because you can't go fast enough. But if I take an electric mixer and, and put it in here, boom, whipped cream. Turns into nice, fluffy whipped cream. So we've done just the opposite here. We have um, taken a machine that does high air content for homemade ice cream, and by slowing down the drive motor, we're going to put less air in. So super premium has less air than homemade. Uh, gelato setting would have less air than um, super premium. And... Um, uh, frozen yogurt, uh, frozen custard would be the lowest air content of any product that is in existence. And just by going here and hitting begin, and I'm looking for frozen custard or uh, for frozen yogurt, frozen no, custard. No. Sorry. Um, well, here's use that word yogurt. Here. I, I can turn that on, and it's now going to go to a slower RPM. People ask, well, what's the RPM? It doesn't matter because my RPMs won't translate over to anybody else's machine. Uh, but the, the secret to this and what makes it uh, an invention uh, is that um, normally if you take a motor, this is a three horsepower motor, that's massive. Uh, you take a three horsepower motor and put a, a light dimmer on it, like in your dining room, and you dim it down from three horse 
or your light bulbs, 100 watt, and you dim them down to a romantic 20 watts for dinner. Um, you are literally robbing the power from the light bulb. You're stealing the power away. So if you tried to put a rheostat on this machine, a light dimmer, your three horsepower motor is now only going to be, say, a third horsepower, which will not be strong enough to pull through all this mass of ice cream. So nobody's ever done it before. But I found an application where uh, I can dim down the motor and it's still three horsepower, no matter what speed I run at. So I'm going to run at super premium today on this. And so I pick that and it's going to go to a lower speed than homemade. I turn on the refrigeration and I start a timer. Now we don't put gadgets on our machines uh, that are just gadgets for the sake of it. Like you'll notice there's no hose here. Um, all the other companies have a hose. Well, there's a problem with the hose. It's only cold water. And if you've ever dropped an egg on the floor or cream and tried to clean it up with cold water, you know you're going to be there all day long. You need hot water. And also, that little hose here will only reach to here. Well, what if I spill on top here? Or what if I spill down here? It's not going to reach it. So why put a $300 addition onto the machine uh, when it's not going to be viable? It's a whole lot easier just to get it just disappeared. A gallon of wa hot water and pour it into the machine. Uh, we don't put a timer on the machine. Um, companies that have timers on it really don't know how to make ice cream. I, I noticed uh, that when Paula bakes a cake, um, she uh, sets the timer, say, for 23 minutes. And then she goes off and does other things. Uh, in the, if you were making ice cream, you'd be doing like Jeff. You'd get a, getting your water ready, your cleaning, your utensils. You got other things going on. When the timer goes off, Paula goes back to the oven and says, oh, OK, it looks like a cake, pulls it out, and sticks a fork in it. If the cake uh, sticks to the fork, it's not ready, and she gives it another two or three minutes. So her timer of 23 minutes was an approximation of how long it takes to make a cake. We have an approximation of uh, eight to 10 minutes, depending on the flavor. And do I have everything in here? No. Um, so I don't put timers on because the higher the sugar, and this is the important point, the higher the sugar content of a product, the longer the freezing time. Um, dairy is, ice cream, is very low in sugar and very high in fat. Italian ices are no fat, but all sugar, very high in sugar. So Italian ices take, uh, depending on the machine, 16, 14 to 18 minutes to make a batch because of the high sugar content. Well, if I, go right ahead, just pour them right in. If I had uh, a machine with a timer that always shut off at eight minutes, I'd always have perfect vanilla. But I've seen these machines. We've done side-by-side uh, -side, uh, operations at trade shows, and their salesman has to go over and just kind of turn the timer back on because he knows the machine, the ice cream isn't ready. So uh, it is not an exact science, neither is baking. And anybody who tries to mechanize that part doesn't understand the mechanics of making ice cream. Um, so we use a, and also if you have a timer on the machine, like in the Capigiani, it's tied to the entire machine. So if the timer goes down, it takes down the whole machine. Now you're out of business. It's Saturday night, your timer broke. Not the machine, the timer broke. And your whole machine is out of business. With this, this is a $6 timer from CVS. If this breaks, you throw it away. And you either use your watch or you go to CVS and you get another timer. Or I don't think Jeff has ever used a timer. And we forgot something else? No, I would add a little more. OK. I just tasted it. All right. Just wing add. it? Huh? Just wing it? Yeah. All right. Jeff says add more flavor. So I'm going to go to the center here. And good. All right. And that will all mix uh, completely through it. So we don't put gadgets on the machines. Uh, we keep it as simple as we can because gadgets break and gadgets take down the machine. Yes? So actually, I just have to go to your point, actually. You have to taste it. So you can taste it off the top like that. And you got a feel for He's like, oh, I need more mints. Yeah. So that's something, obviously, you would encourage kind of like a, like you're making sauce or something like that. You're, you're, you're checking it. Well, it's something we never made before, and I like things a little more flavorful. Uh, but 
good point because if you and I made the same ice cream, let's say you got my book and we both made uh, key lime ice cream, yours would come out different than mine because you would taste it and you'd say, needs a little more sugar, needs a little, and I would say, well, it needs, it's okay. That, so that's what makes your ice cream store different from his ice cream store. And that's important because although you're the judge of your flavors, you should be aware of everyone else. I have a core group of people that try my new ice creams before I sell it. I think it's great. If I don't think it's great, they don't get to taste it. It gets dumped. But if I think it's great, not good, great, then I'll give it to these three people and see what do you think. And uh, usually I don't care what they think because I know it's great. <laughs> now, don't do the mistake that I do as uh, we just made a change to the formula, didn't we? Uh, we just added another ounce uh, of, of the flavor. So right on your paper, increase this formula by one ounce. Because otherwise, if you're experimenting and you're making what I think is a mistake of making five or six batches, you ought to be able to do it in three. Uh, all of a sudden, you hit the perfect one, you go, oh my gosh, which, what, what, what did I do different? Because you forget. You're busy. You're doing other things. Always write it down. And then I tell the employees, I hand them a three by five file card, and I say, here, go make this ice cream. And um, uh, I tell them, I say, listen, if you break the Emory Thompson, if you take a metal spoon, which you shouldn't be using, and drop it in the machine and the machine locks up, don't worry about it. We'll call Emory Thompson. They'll have us up and running in five minutes. But here's my formula for mint chip. And you say, uh, you know what, the boss is a jerk. He doesn't know how to make it. I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add four more ounces of mint chip. It doesn't matter what you like, the ice cream maker, it's what the public is used to. I know just what four C's ice cream mint chip tastes like up in uh, Cape Cod. And if I haven't been there in a number of years, I'll let you handle that. If if I haven't been there in a number of years, I can't wait to get back to Cape Cod and, and have my uh, Four C's mint chip. And it better not have changed, because that's the way I like it. So we always tell people, if you break the machine, don't worry about it, you're not gonna lose your job. But if you change the formula, we're gonna break your kneecaps, and then we're gonna drag you out into the street and shoot you, because you're risking my entire business. You have changed my formula. The McDonald's hamburger is a lousy hamburger, but it's a lousy hamburger in Tampa, Florida, in, uh, in Saigon, in uh, Moscow, uh, in South Africa, it's the same lousy hamburger everywhere. So when you go through the Golden Arches, you know exactly what you're going to get. And we want people to know that when they go up to your ice cream parlor, that's exactly the mint chip the way I remember it, unless you, the boss, change it. So making those fine changes is very important, and then stick to it. <laughs> we don't have a scoop. We have... Hmm. <clears throat> Okay. How close are we? We're, we're all right. We'll use this for now. I brought that out. Too. Okay, we'll use both. Try to give out small portions because this is for me. <laughs> yes? Uh, I have a quick question. So, how, would you recommend, uh, you talked about having a breakout. Do you have an extra, um, let's set up blades? Do you recommend having that? Because obviously, how, how easy, like, you would have to see that your business. So, if something happens, someone drops a spoon in there. Nobody's dropping a spoon in the machine. Yeah, the question, because other people couldn't hear it uh, on, the, on the video, <coughs> is uh, would you keep spare parts around in case you lose something? Some pieces, yes. The little springs, um, the little springs that push the blades out, um, I, I would keep them. Anybody here own a Glock? Thing. Uh, okay. Anybody who's ever cleaned a Glock has got holes in their ceiling because when they took the Glock uh, 9 millimeter apart or the 45, the spring came off and went boom right up into the attic. He's smiling because he's had it happen. So I would keep the springs on hand. The blades are going to last five years and I don't think you're going to lose them. I would probably keep an extra front gasket because that might get thrown out in the wash. But otherwise you're looking at uh, you know, maybe $50 worth of spare parts. I don't have an extra set of springs. I'm just saying, you know? Yeah, maybe you should. Okay, now Jeff is using the infinite overrun control to speed it up to maximum. 
to help push the product out even faster. See how fast that comes out? We want to get the product out fast. Uh, other machinery takes forever to get it out, and that's bad because then your first product will weigh heavier than your last. And we want, again, consistency. If you're broiling a steak and it's medium rare after eight minutes and you start to pull it out of the oven and you take one slice out and then one slice out and then one slice out, by the time you get all that steak out, the steak's going to be well done because you took so long getting it out. We got that out in less than 30 seconds. How's it look? Looks good. Um, I'm going to take the first gamble. Okay, come on up, have some. Oh, it's delicious. I could have even gone for more men. How do you like the color? Well, uh, I would have liked it white. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah. There won't be much to take home. Again, I was experimenting, so already I've tasted it, and I think it needs more mint. So I'll adjust my formula up tomorrow. Is this a 10% at that point? Yes. What? Okay, give me a quarter. <laughs> quarter for quarter. What are you making next, Jeff? M&M Italian ice. So I don't really have to rinse it out except for the color. I don't have to worry about the Well, there's mint in there. <laughs> yeah, we'll get the mint out. I like that color. That's just not a bad color. I like it. I think it's a pretty color, but I would like a little stronger flavor. I, I think the worst thing you can do in making ice cream is you hand someone a pale pink ice cream and they say, oh, that's delicious. What is it? Well, if you can't tell that it's red raspberry, and so that's okay, the camera done it to me. If you can't tell that it's um, red raspberry instead of strawberry, I've failed as an ice cream maker. I want strong, intense flavor. That's what's wrong with most ice creams, is you're, you're tasting it and you go like Breyer's coffee. You go, huh, what is it? Now, I want to get the mint flavor out of there for Jeff's M&M, so I'm going to do a couple of quick rinses. Thank you, sir. Jeff, did you meet Giselle? Not yet. She is our newest employee. She's going to be taking over the international desk. Hello, Giselle. Oh, come on. Thank you. <coughs> All right, so what do you say? More flavor? Yes? Should have put more in? You like it. Okay. You get a free machine. <laughs> uh, yes. Ladies first. Yeah. What did you put water in here? Water's in there. I'm oh, going to get the rest of the ice cream out. Oh, sorry. Um, very simple. It's against. It's very no. Very simple. It's against the law. The Food and Drug Administration, going all the way back to 1929, the Great Depression. Uh, it was the first foray that the federal government had into controlling private business. And without going into a lot of detail, the federal government says even though you have pasteurized milk at the supermarket and pasteurized cream and skim milk powder, when you buy them at the supermarket and bring them back home, unless it's for your own personal consumption, we want it repasteurized. We are the only country in the world that does this. It's Crystal. just flat out stupid uh, because it doesn't improve anything. It doesn't risk anything not to do it, but it's the law. And they'll shut you down uh, pretty quickly if you don't. So that's the big problem because for you to be pasteurizing your own mitch, which, which you can do, and I can recommend a pasteurizer. The VAT pasteurizer is made in the United States and it does a beautiful job. Uh, but you're looking at another ten or fifteen thousand dollars. And to me, and I don't know if it's a good analogy or not, but I always tell people 
if I was going to open up a bakery and I'm going to do great baked goods, uh, I'm not going to have a wheat field out back. And I'm not going to have a mill that's going to grind the wheat so that I can have my own wheat. The wheat is the ba base ingredient for all my pastries. To me, what makes a great pastry shop is how good the chef is of mixing flavors. So he buys flour in 100-pound bags. And we're buying the dairy from dairy scientists. I can take it a step further and make it even more complicated. There are Jer Jerseys, Guernseys, Holsteins, and a couple other brands of cows. And they all produce different fat contents as it comes out of the cow. So I said 39%. That's an average. They go as high as 44 and down to 37. So when you're buying your milk, if you could find 100 gallons of cream, which would be very hard to get, um, how do you know what the true fat content is? And now you need to be a math wizard because last week you were running 39 and now you're running 42. And you're breaking my first rule of business is consistency. Gee, you should have been here last week. Her, uh, her uh, mint chip was fantastic. And this week it's kind of bland. And you can't afford that. When you work with a dairy, they have scientists who do all this mathematics and do all this blending so that no matter when you get Also, cows give out different fat contents between winter and summer. I don't remember which way it is, but it's a nightmare. And uh, there was a whole craze about this. Jeff and I lived through three years ago. Everybody wanted to make their own mix. And we said, fine, if you do, we'll teach you, we'll show you how to do it. They went into the business and they went out of the business just as fast because their food costs were so much higher than anybody else because they couldn't compete with the dairy. Yes, you had a question. Is the mix shelf stable? The mix is not shelf stable. Uh, you have to refrigerate it. Um, most of the, a lot of the dairies are using something called ultra high temperature UHT pasteurization. So you can get uh, three or four weeks out of it. Um, but um, you, you do have to use it. What I do is I only, I only do this class every other month. So I get a delivery of mix uh, to handle two classes and I freeze it. So I've got frozen mix in there. And then last Friday I took it out of the freezer and put it in the refrigerator and let it warm up all the way till today. What do you have access to? To uh, fresh mix? Yep. It's going to be difficult. Um, where are you located that you're not going to have fresh mix? Well, you I'm from Guam. From Guam, right, OK. Uh, you'd have to go to a powdered mix. Uh, or I just spoke to someone in northern Africa overnight last night. And uh, they absolutely cannot get anything dairy in his country. And I said, I suggest you do. Uh, Italian ices, you can always get a little bit of cream and sell cream ices because his climate is hotter than here. Uh, the income levels are lower than here. And so by selling a cream ice, he's getting a very delicious product uh, that um, he can sell. Jeff's going to make right now, and then I'll shut up. Uh, he's going to make M&M Italian ice. It's unheard of. Nobody growing up when I was. We had lemon, cherry, grape, orange, and chocolate. And that was it. Uh, and, and then uh, my customer, Ralph's up in Staten Island, Larry DiStefano. Larry said, you know, it's really hot in Florida, and, and ice cream doesn't sell as well as it does up north. Why can't I use ice cream flavors in a sugar water base? So he took a bag of chocolate chip cookies and threw it into sugar and water. And chocolate chip cookie Italian ice was born. Uh, or Oreo cookie, or peanut butter and jelly, which I'm going to make later, peanut butter. And Jeff now is going to make, I mean, nobody 10 years ago ever heard of making Oreo, I mean, uh, M&M uh, Italian ice. I've never made it. You've never made it, so now he's going to do it. So here you go. If you can't get dairy, do Jeff's product here. It'll sell even better. Well, that work, if you, well, if you can get the dairy ingredients, then yeah, pasteurize it. That's no problem. But when my, you get up to the big course, scale, my question, of course, why live in Guam? <laughs> Pretty hot here. Yeah, it's all yours, Professor. Okay, uh, M and M Italian ice. I never made it, but Steve reminded me yesterday that I had left a bag of M and M's in the freezer. So, a penny errand is a penny saved, whatever. So, uh, the formula for Italian ice is normally three, two, one which is uh, three quarts of water, two pounds of sugar, 
and one quart of stuff, right? Stuff. Yes. Used to be the stuff in the cans and the jars, but people aren't using that much anymore, are they? Not at all. Now if they listen to us. Right. So uh, I've got a little more water. I've got four quarts instead of three, uh, just because it feels right. Uh, and then we have two pounds of sugar. So normally this would be three, two, one. But we have four, because I think it'll handle it. Uh, Steve likes me to mix the sugar in the water before we pour it in the machine, uh, even though I don't do that. Yeah, but you get your blades for free. Well, I haven't changed blades in, in a cow's age, but we'll do it his way, because it's his store and his machine. So we will uh, mix the sugar and the water just to make it easier. My thoughts are, I've got the greatest mixer in the world right there. Um, 234 revolutions a minute, mixing it in a flash. Certainly better than this. <laughs> but okay, we'll do it his way. So we'll pour the water in the machine, the water and the sugar. Look at him spill. No wonder he needs a bucket underneath. Four, so he's going to spill one. <laughs> you check the floor out at the end of the day from that machine yeah, to this machine. Yeah, well, just because I leave the gate open. And this is uh, M&M's that we, you saw it happen, but uh, uh, we put them in the uh, Ninja uh, prior to the show being recorded, and all we did was uh, pulverize them. All right, These quick are, question. Do I just take them right off the shelf and throw them in the Ninja? <laughs> Glad you asked. Thank you. Uh, no, the, the most efficient way is to freeze them. And any candy can be made this way. Uh, in my book, I've got Snickers, uh, M&M's, uh, Milky Way. But I've done um, Butterfinger, uh, Heath Bar, uh, any candy. You can, do, and you can do Baby Ruth. I've done Payday. I recently did Payday. That's a really good one. Uh, take the payday pieces or any candy bar from the shelf, cut them into little pieces, and then freeze them overnight. The next day, put them in this baby, grind them up to get this, and you're good to go. Genius. Nobody ever thought of that? Okay, we'll start this thing humming. We'll put it on Italian ice. <laughs> and we'll start her up. What's Italian ice? One, uh, two, full, 234. It's full, right? Yeah. yeah, because there's no dairy in it, so you're not right. going to get any overrun. And we'll add the M&Ms. While Steve explains what's going on. He's adding the M&M. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All I did was rinse it. And now I didn't clean the machine, I rinsed the machine. Yeah. As long, again, as long as we don't open the door and put our hands in there, we haven't broken the sterility. Well, I did that so too. Just, don't tell them. So by just putting water in there, we're not uh, contaminating the machine. And you can literally go 24 <laughs> hours a day on these machines. There's no such thing as resting them. You'll need to rest. Now we'll turn on the refrigeration. Uh, it's, it's mixing pretty good now. And since it's at full speed for Italian ice, we can go now, I guess. Should, you get the mint chip? Should we go now? Go for it. All right. I don't use a timer. <laughs> Real men don't use timers. That's right. <laughs> they do, but they do drive Volkswagen Beetles that look like a circus clown. I have a new category for a book I'll tell you later about um, freezing. Let's talk about these. What's that? The adjustable shelf? You yeah. Like it? Yeah, that's, that's something new. We, we've always had the adjustable shelf on this. this you know CD why it's good? You know what I made? I made a steel uh, platform for when I'm doing pints. Uh huh. So that I, because mine is only here. Yeah. So I put it there so I can do this. Yeah. 
But and all now, you have to do is, at great cost, change out the two side panels. This panel right here. At great cost? Yes. I know somebody. Yeah, I know you know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these panels here, right? Yeah, it's not hard. Is it hard to do? No? No, it just bolts on. I know somebody. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> well, we'll talk. <laughs> I like that. We'll, we'll do a walk talk. How Not did you determine the heights? Um, two and a half gallon and then uh, smaller containers and then a gelato pan right here. All the machines have this now? Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. I'd get one now. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, what? it's freezing. Uh, no. I asked her. He said, no, let's do straight Italian ice. To do cream ice... Uh, all we would do is add one quart of mix to this, which I was going to do, but um, so be it. We'll just try Italian ices. Has anybody not had Italian ices before? Come on, be honest. Okay. Okay. How many of you call it water ice? When did you leave Philadelphia? Okay. In New York, it's called Italian ice. Uh, in Brooklyn, it's called what's it to you? And down in Philadelphia, it's called Italian water ice. There actually is a difference. Using the bigger machine, the two tubs, uh, a New York Italian ice for lemon ice, I'm using seven pounds of sugar, 14 quarts of water, and two quarts of fresh squeezed lemon juice. And the zest, uh, the little specks of a lemon, you take a cheese grater and your knuckles, and you uh, grate off the outside skin. So you have this pure white product with little specks of lemon and try to keep the blood out. Um, but in New York, I'm Crystal. using seven pounds of sugar. That's the formula that we like. You go down to Philadelphia where they change the name to water ice instead of Italian ice, they like their products smoother. And the way you make it smoother is add one pound of sugar. That's all there is. It's, no, it's, it's a secret to everybody else except for people who tune in to Emory Thompson. So in New York, seven pounds of sugar for a New York Italian ice. Philadelphia water ice, eight pounds of sugar. We go back to Brooklyn where they told you what's it to you and they don't speak English. It's six pounds of sugar because they make something called a granita or a granite and it is a very coarse tasting ice. They love it. I don't. But you, uh, you sell what your neighborhood likes. And then you get up to Rhode Island and they change the name from Italian ice or water ice or any of those names and they call it slush. And it's not slush like you get at a 7-Eleven with the bright colors. It's Italian ice with a different name. And that stuff is just absolutely awful. And it's five pounds of sugar. Uh, but that sells well, so I can't really make too much fun of it because it sells machines. So the difference between all these different products is just the sugar content. So um, we're going to make a product later. I don't have the recipe with me, but it's going to be a, a Nilla wafer cookies. And it's a, a recipe from one of my customers. What? Well, these are the chips that were left over. Well, that's because I didn't in. take all the ice cream out. I know. I'm going to throw them in. Okay. Um, so he wrote me back and he said, you know what, Steve? Add another cup of sugar to the recipe. He said, uh, sugar not only makes things smoother, but it enhances the flavor. If you're making an Italian ice and you say, well, it's just not enough cherry or it's not, just not enough... Uh, um, any flavor, grape. Uh, not necessarily would you add more flavor, you might add just a little bit more sugar. Sugar enhances the flavor. Uh, you'll see in old time recipes that uh, it calls for salt in your ice cream. Well, I've had numerous chefs tell me that salt enhances the flavor of ice cream. I've never seen it, I don't believe it. I think what it comes from is this is what my grandfather was using before he invented the modern day mechanized batch freezer. And when you're putting this together with rock salt and ice as your source of cold, guess what happens? A little bit of salt falls into the recipe, into the mix. So the recipe's all called for a pinch of salt. It was like this one lady, when I told her that story, she said, you know what, I can back that up. My grandmother used to say that when you uh, made this certain uh, dinner of hers, uh, turkey dinner, um, you had to use a 9-inch pan, uh, tw let's say 12-inch pan, 12-inch pan to make this dinner. Uh, and so she had to go out and find a 12-inch pan. It was very strictly in there, a 12-inch pan. Not a 9, not a 14, but a 12. 
And so that was passed down from the great-grandmother to the grandmother, and then from the grandmother to the mother. And so then the daughter, being a little bit of a wise ass, goes, why do I need a 12-inch pan? Because it's in the recipe. Well, great-grandma's still alive. Let's call her up and ask her, why do we have to have a 12-inch pan? Because I don't own a 14-inch pan. So sometimes that's why stuff gets into a recipe. It doesn't mean it's right. It's just, oh, that's the way we've always done it. So keep in mind, how are we doing? Good. We're doing good. Not ready yet. OK. So keep talking. Yes. So for ISIS, what's the process for serving them to provide or Wow, good question. OK. The, the question is, how do you serve Italian ISIS? Um, freezing also. When it, and freezing. When it comes out of the machine, because we're in the business of producing a lot of product as, as much as we can in an hour, we're going to pull it out at a consistency that would be a little too soft to serve uh, to the general public. If, if, the, if my employees come running in and it's 1.30 and they just say, we just ran out of M&M and we need it right away, I will make a batch and I will freeze it stiffer in the machine and I can take it right out and serve it but it's going to eject slower, it might leave more in the machine, but otherwise I'm going to make it so that it flows out fast, and then right next to you, which the cameras can't see, is a Sears chest freezer, and I'm just going to throw it in there. And uh, I can leave it in there, uh, and it'll turn rock hard, hard, you know, just solid, you couldn't scoop it with a hammer and chisel, but you could keep it for days and weeks at that temperature. Uh, nothing special, it's just anything that's below zero, or zero degrees or colder because I'm scooping it in my store, Jeff's is diff Jeff would be different if I had a store, 16 degrees. Ice cream's at six, Italian ice is at 16. So you can't put them in the same cabinet. In fact, if you ever see, go into an ice cream parlor and you see Italian ice and ice cream in the same cabinet, run like hell. It means that there are so many chemicals in the Italian ice to lower the freezing point, things like glycerin to lower the freezing point so we can scoop it in the same cabinet. They need separate cabinets. You need one of these. This is a, yeah. I use this for Italian ices. I like this because I can set the temperature to uh, a warmer temperature, 16 degrees. Uh, the lid flops over, so when the serve, if you go to an old time pastry shop in Astoria, <laughs> Queens, you're, and you ask for a lemon ice, in fact, lemon ice is so generic that people walk in and say, give me a cherry lemon ice. Give me a mint chip lemon ice. The term is lemon ice. You, you see the server flip this over. You see the server's hand going like this once or twice. And then they pull it out and they put it into, in New York, a squeeze cup. That's a three and a half ounce squeeze cup. Uh, if, if you look it up and try to buy these anywhere, you won't find it under squeeze cup you know, west of the Hudson River. It's known as a pleated, like a lady's dress, a pleated water cup. And by the time we put the ice in here and crown it over, that's four ounces. And we're selling that for two, two fifty, three bucks. So the server's back here, scooping like this, moving their arm, and then they put it in here and they sell it to you. What the server's actually doing is, since there's no chemicals in my Italian ice, a little puddle of lemon juice forms in the center, just a small one, and the server's remixing it like this, before they put it in here. So you can serve it like that. And I'll be out of your way in a second, Jeff. Uh, that would be a lemon ice. Um, this would be a gelati. Gelati is a made up name. We used to call that a parfait. Uh, this would be some cherry ice, some vanilla ice cream that you made at your batch freezer instead of a soft serve, some more uh, cherry ice, and some more ice cream. Uh, a gelati or parfait. Um, I can't find my. It's right there. Where? The fancy glass? Yep. Point. I can't see it. Right behind Jeff. Right behind Jeff. Okay. Thank you. You've been watching the videos. <laughs> this is an Italian ice. This is a sorbet. This costs two bucks. This costs seven dollars. And the only difference between sorbet and Italian ice is the way you're presenting it. Lemon, cherry, grape, orange, chocolate over here is mango, kiwi, papaya, champagne. A little upscale flavors, same stuff. Don't let anybody ever tell you different. It's just the presentation. How is it? I'm eating it. <laughs> you better come up and get some before he eats it all. 
Steve, feel the weight of this. Feel the weight of this container. Whoa, baby! It's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that great? And it's mostly water. Mmm. Oh, that's good. That's good. Thank you. What's the color on this? It's brown. <laughs> not uh, not appealing in a dipping case, is it? Yeah. Oh no. Maybe Six. in Guam, but not here. Six degrees Fahrenheit for ice cream. Here we give you extra plates. Guam, huh? How many people live on Guam? Seven. How many of them eat ice cream? Two. Now this portion that Jeff's giving you cost about 10 cents. All the ingredients, 10 cents. And you're going to sell this for two or three dollars. Uh, the profit margins are just absolutely unbelievable. And the equipment to get into Italian ice is just so simple. A three compartment sink, a batch freezer, a chest freezer, and some way to serve it. And serving it, I'll show you another way you can serve it, um, which is terrific. Here is something made by a company called Carlisle in uh, Pennsylvania. And that they call an ice cream server. That sells for about $87. It comes in white or black. And this has got something in between it, like glycol. And you put, I put this in the freezer the night before. And I'll pass this around. This is just absolutely super cold. And so you can take your tub of Italian ices or ice cream, drop it in there, and now you're good for about three hours. So you don't even need a dipping cabinet. Uh, if you had a push cart, you could take a couple of three or four of these out and, and sell it that way. So I'm going to pass that around for you to see. One last thing. What? We're ready. Oh, the Italian ice. Um, one thing about Italian ice, I've had a lot of people call up and buy the CB350. Um, just thousands of them. It's the number one selling machine in the world. And many of them call up, and quite frankly, they don't have a lot of money. Uh, they don't want to go on welfare, they want to keep working, but they don't have a lot of money. So they can afford this machine from Emory Thompson and get into the Italian ice business. And they usually start it's with a push cart. And ice. they uh, go out on weekends, they keep their regular job, and they go out on weekends and they sell Italian ices, and it's an all-cash business, and they bring in a lot of income selling just Italian ice. Well, that was the way I was selling them, and I encouraged it because uh, my goal in life is to make as many jobs as I can. And each time I open an ice cream parlor, it's a minimum of 11 jobs that uh, will be created. And so this one person, one batch freezer, one push cart. After a short amount of time, they want to expand. And they want to go into a second push cart, and a third push cart, and a fourth push cart. And I tell them, you can't divide yourself that way. There's only one of you. Who's going to run it? So if you start hiring people, now you've got to worry about running QuickBooks for your employees. You've got to uh, you know, do all the federal paperwork that's required. You've got one guy coming in, and you say, hey, gee, boss, I know you, had 90, you said there were 97 portions in this tub, but uh, you know, I only got 53 today. And he's leaning sideways because he's got all his change in your pocket. So the theft goes on. And it, it just isn't a good use of time. So I say to the guy, uh, when you went out last weekend to that ballpark, you know, the Little League game, uh, did anybody come up to you and say, gee, I wish I could do that? And he goes, oh, I'll tell you, it just drives me nuts. So many people come up and they say, gee, I wish I could do that. And there's the stock answers that they always give. Oh, no, no, no. You could never do this. This recipe came from my great-great-grandfather from Genoa, Italy. It actually came from a, uh, from a Presbyterian from New Rochelle, New York. So that lie is out the window. We've got the formulas right up there at the website. 
Uh, the other answer, which is a little more true, is, oh, no, you can't do this because you're going to have to buy it from Little Jimmy's or Via Veneto or Rosati, one of my big wholesalers. Um, and in order to get this to you in Florida from Pennsylvania, it's going to cost you $80 a tub. Well, you're still making about 250 gross, so 250 minus 80 isn't too bad. But they don't have the flavors that you always want. And they freeze it down to zero, so it's rock hard. And then when they ship it to you, it's all loaded on a tractor trailer that they don't own. And it has an expensive refrigeration unit on it called the reefer. And the uh, driver turns off the reefer as soon as he leaves your business up in Pennsylvania because he's got um, uh, frozen green beans on board and he's got DiGiorno pizzas. So if the green beans thaw a little bit and then he turns it back on, they refreeze, no problem. If the DiGiorno pizza melts a little bit and refreezes, you'll never notice a difference. A little maybe ice on it. They do that. Yeah. I've talked to these bums. Pizza save on fuel oil. Can you believe them? It's, it's expensive. So what happens to your rice? The flavor, when you start to melt this a little bit, f falls to the bottom. Kids love it. They always want to get the ice at the bottom. It's all sticky and gooey and horrible. Um, so you get an ice that isn't very good. So, and their minimum order is $1,000. Uh, the $1,000, if you can come up with it, great. But $1,000 of worth of Italian ice is going to take up all that space over there. So you're going to have to rent uh, freezer space just to be able to buy from a wholesaler. If you make your own ice, that goes out the window. So this, this guy who came up to you and said, gee, I wish I could do that, and you told him you couldn't uh, for those two reasons, the better thing to say is, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sell you my ice. You call me on Tuesday and you tell me what you want. You need three cherry, you need a, a mango, you need, need two lemon ice. Uh, uh, you place the order with me and you come pick it up Friday afternoon at my place. I've rented uh, a small little spot in a, a less expensive part of town where I'm making my ice uh, or I'm doing it out of the garage if I can get away with it. And you come pick it up. Cash. No credit cards, no checks, no broken promises, no, uh, net, net, no net 30, no net anything, just cash. You bring the cash, you get the tubs. And that person then takes those tubs, which are zero degrees, you couldn't scoop it with a hammer and chisel, and he takes them home, he puts them in his igloo cooler, takes them home to his house where he's got a chest freezer, like the one over there, the Sears chest freezer, and he stores it in his place, and then he goes out with the push cart that he bought for $1,500 this weekend. And so now you're not running a second push cart, he's running it. You just sold him the ice. You sold it for $40, you made it for $10. You made a $30 profit on each tub and you didn't have to do any work. Oh, there's one caveat. By the way, uh, I'm selling you ice. That's Prospect Park over there, that's mine. If I catch you in Pro Prospect Park, it's back to breaking the kneecaps. And we won't sell you ice, we'll tell, we'll, because that's my park. That's where I'm going this weekend. So you're controlling the market. Even to the point, I had this very old man, he was, he was old when I was 22, named Michelizzi Ice up in Bridgeport. And if old man Michelizzi didn't like you, he didn't sell you ice. And it wasn't that he didn't like you, it was you ran a sloppy looking pizza parlor, it was dirty. So he didn't want his good product reputation being ruined in his pizza parlor, and since he's selling it to you, he controlled the market. But everybody I've told this to now has 20 people buying ice from them. And that's, you know, at $40 a tub, that's not 20 employees, that's not 20 QuickBooks and accounts uh, and all this other stuff that you have to do with running a business. It's just here. You bring the cash, I do this. And then with the cameras off and nobody's watching because we know it's just us, it's a cash business. Don't be foolish. Re file your tax returns and report some income every year because if you don't, the IRS is going to come in, they're going to say, hmm, well, we can't price how much water he used. Uh, he's buying sugar from 10 different locations, and we don't know how much uh, cherry is in his cherry ice, but we're just going to guess that he made $30,000 profit this year, and we're going to tax him on $30,000. Just give him the $30,000. I, I had a guy up in Island, New Jersey, and um, I didn't like the guy much. He owes me uh, $463, and the problem is he died 15 years ago, so I'm going to have trouble collecting, but I will. Uh, anyway, he gets called into an audit, and he is wearing a, a shirt, a T-shirt that was dirty, had ices all over it, with his company name on the front. 
He's wearing a gold Rolex with the diamond encrusted all the way around it. And he sits down with the lady IRS agent and she's going through his so-called books. And he looks at his diamond encrusted watch and so after 20 minutes and says, hey, lady, my driver's waiting outside for me. Do you mind hurrying this up? You know, <laughs> they threw the book at him. So if you're going to be in a cash business, be sensible about it. I mean, the IRS here, uh, you talk to our accountants here, uh, they look at every piece of steel that comes in. And when they look at small business, they're going to just make a, a guesstimate of what they think you earned uh, because they see you're driving a brand new Volkswagen Beetle with uh, a crazy paint job. And they're going to say, huh, I bet that guy made 40000 this year. So... Uh, be sensible about it, but this is how you can get into a business for very inexpensive. We're going to take a 15-minute break so, yeah, okay. so that everybody can use the bathrooms, walk around, get some coffee, water, go pet Sammy. Get a copy uh, of the book. Buy a copy of the book. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about the book when I come back. Okay. So let's take a break. We'll turn the cameras off, and we'll be back in 15, 14 minutes. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So? Oh, welcome to sunny Florida. Gee. Look at that. That's it's been raining cool. for three weeks now. Oh, we're going to do that. We'll do it in here, okay? Did you bring in the uh, stack of recipes? Yeah, I'm handing them out. Oh, you are already? No, you don't want to hand it out? No, I do. Yeah. You're way ahead of me. Great. Okay, where's the outlet for this? Right here. Oh, oh we have to there's just... a problem. No, it isn't. Why is it a problem? Because we're going to need this too. Why? Oh, we're not. Oh no, that's what no, we're using. We won't this. need it. We, we won't, won't need that. Need it. All right, here we go. Three and a half quarts mix. Jack, you got us up. You're good to go, Steve. Okay, thank you. I'm not going to need that. Okay, um, Spencer's Pudding Ice Cream is named after uh, one of my customers, uh, Mr. Spencer. Uh, this is a family recipe, and uh, he wanted to make it. He made it for his uh, step-grandfather uh, a few weeks ago, and they said, boy, you ought to turn that into an ice cream. And he was going to be here to demonstrate it, but uh, you know, the weather scared him off because we haven't been sunny Florida for three weeks now. Bananas and cool with Bananas. And so we're going to make it in his stead. And we're going to use bananas and Cool Whip and Philadelphia cream cheese and all sorts of good stuff. What we thought we would do is, uh, since we're winging it, we thought we would uh, mix this in here, make it a little easier, and uh, see what happens. If it doesn't mix up, then we'll go to plan B. We break for lunch. <laughs> right. <laughs> Come up with another flavor. Yeah. We've had All to right. do that sometimes. So in order to get these things together, let's put a little mix in here. Now let's put all the mix in here. That's three and a half quarts. And the cream cheese. <laughs> this is our CB350. Uh, this makes half a tub in about eight minutes. So if you were doing uh, ice creams with this, you would make, uh, say, a half a tub of this product, put it in the freezer, reload it, make another half tub, eight minutes later, pull that out of the freezer, and just put it on top. Eight minutes, there's not going to be any difference. There wouldn't be any difference for an hour or more. So uh, we can produce a, uh, a tub, uh, let's say, with loading and unloading in about 20 minutes. So three tubs an hour, that's nine gallons an hour that you could make on this machine. We didn't think about this yesterday, did we? Right? Might have been a little easier to work with. Uh, we went with, to make the s'mores, we, we decided on marshmallow fluff. That's like plastic concrete. <laughs> it's awful stuff. <laughs> Too thin. Too thin. How does it taste? I have no idea. I never ate this. Let's see how it tastes. What is it supposed to be? Cool Whip? Uh, what?
That wouldn't work. It's much too light. There's nothing there. Uh, so we have, how about the bananas? Uh, we'll add them into the machine, won't we? Right. Okay, so we have the mix, the Cool Whip, and the cream cheese in here. Okay. We need sugar. That'll help grind this up, too. Yes, there's sugar right there. One cup of At sugar. At least a cup. At least a cup. Yeah. At least a cup. Ah, let's pour it all in. Hey, Jeff, you want to give these out for lunch? <laughs> How many do I have? You have a bag full. Okay. You got to take them home? Uh, that was when I made um, uh, Cinnabon ice cream. Yes, it was delicious. Now, I came up with two terms for uh, using uh, ingredients, what I call fruit flavor and fruit identity. Uh, here I'm going to take Nilla wafers and I'm going to uh, drop them right into the machine. It's going to grind them up. And if I was blindfolded and tasted, you'd say, yeah, I can taste the Nilla wafers or Oreo cookies or uh, mint chips, uh, anything that goes in the machine, it will give it the flavor. But we also eat with our eyes. You know, so you're looking at strawberry ice cream and you put uh, in the bigger machine a quart of strawberries in, it grinds it up, it's this beautiful pink color. But you look at it and you can't see any pieces. So my second quart of strawberries, I add it as it's coming out. So I have the fruit flavor in the machine. Yep, that's strawberry. And I have the identity, what I can see, uh, uh, in the tub when I'm scooping the ice cream. You can't do that with any other machine because you can't put stuff into it. You can only put liquids in. Uh, they, uh, their barrels are so thin that you'll uh, risk denting the barrel. Uh, the opening is that little as opposed to that big. Uh, so we were, and, they're, and we're much, much stronger and heavier. So we were designed to put stuff in. And the beauty of putting stuff into the machine is for every particle of dairy, I now have a particle of chocolate chip cookie. So my flavor will be much more intense. When you buy commercial ice cream, uh, I belong to a group called Ice Cream Folks. It's a blog. And the gentleman was thinking of going from batch freezers to uh, what's called a continuous freezer. We put haagen in business, we put Ben & Jerry in business, Breyers, Blue Bell, Hershey. They all began with batch freezers, and then they get up to about 400,000 gallons a year, and they go to a $100,000 machine that's a little narrow tube, and it just spits out ice cream, vanilla, at 1,000 gallons an hour. And then you spend another 40,000 to inject the flavor into it. So haagen as good as it is, and started on our machines, will always be uh, vanilla ice cream, uh, with flavor injected into it. So as opposed to batch method, where every particle of the dairy is next to a particle of flavor. Where are you going flavor. with this? Which one? We're going into the CB350. Okay, Let me just... something under there. Okay. You don't trust me, huh? Nope, not a bit. All right. We good? This is the six quart here? This is the six quart. Yeah, the we CB350. Good? We're good. Okay. Oh, you already put the cookies? Oh, no. What? We're going to add the cookies, right? After, right? Yeah. I put, I put a bunch in already. You put them in. Okay. Now, Jeff already poured them into the mix. I could have just, you know, fed them into the machine, but the, the net effect's the same. The opening is so big that we can get everything in there quite easily, which is a real plus. And the barrel is so thick that uh, we welcome you to throw anything in there you want, except for metal spoons. They don't work. This is going to be good. You think? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Fire away. All right. I'm going to run this at homemade. Do I need any vanilla in there? Couldn't hurt. Yeah. Absolutely. I would put some vanilla hurt. in. What do you got? Three and a half quarts of the mix? Yes. Uh, we're adding some vanilla extract, so if you want to put that on the recipe, you can. Um, where'd you put it? About whoa, three oh, and I a forgot. half. It's my vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> three and a half ounces. Yeah. When was the last time you paid for vanilla? Yeah, never. <laughs> vanilla. Well, we'll get this started, and then we'll talk about vanilla for a second. So we're going to run this at homemade. And then we're going to start the refrigeration. 
Is that homemade? It sounds slow. Do I not have this? Uh... No, you don't have. I don't know what you picked. Uh, homemade is up there. Start two thirty four. Okay. And turn on the refrigeration. I know Jeff's blocking <laughs> you, but he just, <laughs> he just turned on the beater for homemade, and then uh, turned on the refrigeration. And I'm going to set a clock on it as a just as an approximation. I, I set them for oh, about the seven minutes. Oh, the bananas. The bananas. The bananas, the best part. Now, don't try this with any other batch freezer. A father called me up, and he said, I do the babysitting for my two sons on weekends uh, so that my wife can get out. And he said, and we, we raised our kids on Sesame Street. We just plunked them down in front of the TV and let them go for hours. Well, he's using my Emory Thompson videos to entertain the kids. And he said he walked by one time and I was feeding bananas into the machine and the six-year-old says to the three-year-old, now don't try this with a tailor. <laughs> and I thought, boy, I, I'm famous. <laughs> now you have, so, you have three bananas, but these are small. I think we could add more. I'm just going to push them right in. Um, I need a spatula. I forgot bananas are round. But just right into the machine. And more. Nothing says great flavor like fresh fruit. And like the six-year-old said, don't try this with any other machine. Oh, he's got them. Okay. Now, Jeff was chastising me a few minutes ago. Why didn't you buy bananas that are all black and speckled? Uh, because I couldn't get any. Um, when bananas are no longer saleable because they're all ugly and mushy, is when they're at their highest sugar content. They are the very best for ice cream. They look awful, uh, but they taste great. And I thought I was so smart. I told that story once um, to a crowd and uh, said, you know, I'm so smart that I go into the green grocer and I tell them, uh, listen, uh, you can't sell these bananas, so I'm gonna buy them from you for half price. And my friend Gary Fraselli up in Chelmsford, Mass., Gary's Ice Cream. Uh, Gary emails me and says, well, you may think you're smart, but I go into the green grocer and I say, you see those blackened bananas over there? You can't sell them. You're going to throw them in your dumpster. They're going to take up room in your dumpster, which is going to cost you money. I'm going to take them off your hands for free. You're lucky I'm not charging you. <laughs> I go, okay, you win. Okay, so everybody's in there, the whole gang. Any questions? Okay, vanilla. Um, vanilla, I go way back. So back in the 70s, uh, we had a coffee crisis. Columbia, which was the la main place for coffee, they're not anymore, um, declared that they had had a bad crop, that the weather was terrible. Nobody on the weather forecasters could find bad weather in Colombia, but we're going to have to triple the cost of coffee. And they did. And coffee went through the roof. Um, Americans reacted by uh, not buying Colombian coffee. In fact, uh, what we did is we did a, a Louisiana thing and added chicory to the coffee. So you could buy um, Maxwell House coffee uh, or any of the others, uh, chock full of nuts, and on the can it would say coffee and chicory. And it was pretty good. And so the coffee sales dropped so dramatically uh, because the Colombians thought, well, you know, these Americans, they'll pay anything. They want their coffee. Well, the, the sale of Colombian coffee went down so badly, all of a sudden the weather got better and the price of coffee beans dropped. Well, in the last three years, the same thing has happened with uh, vanilla. Uh, over in Madagascar and in Mexico and other places, they've all kind of decided that Gee, we had some terrible monsoons, and the weather has gotten off, uh, was so awful that uh, the orchids aren't growing, we can't pick the uh, vanilla beans, and now vanilla, which used to be about $50 a gallon, is 650 bucks. That's a lot. 
A vanilla ice cream used to be your cheapest ice cream. Now it's your most expensive. Um, so a company that I like a lot, Lockhead, who specializes in vanilla, has the $600 uh, vanilla. I've had to lock it away because Jeff loves to use it. Uh, but they have a new pie, and that's called pure vanilla. They have come out with a new vanilla, which is uh, the same vanilla beans, but it's called, uh, as, a, as written by the Food and Drug Administration, it's called All Natural. And it's uh, flavor number 103A, but it's an all natural two fold vanilla. Two fold just means it's twice as strong. Uh, so you should have to use half as much. Uh, if they were making this batch, their recipe coming from them would be uh, about three quarters of an ounce of vanilla. Uh, Jeff just poured in somewhere around four. He uses uh, uh, an ounce of vanilla. Not mine. <laughs> Jeff, yeah, not his vanilla, uses a, an ounce per quart which is pretty outrageous. But then again, his ice creams are really outrageous and people talk about them. People talk about my ice cream, but they usually talk about the <laughs> Sharknado that I made, which was a, there's a shark up there. You people can't see it in the camera. It was a great idea. It was a cherry Italian ice, blood red, you know, blood. And it was when uh, the uh, Sharknado movies were popular. And for, uh, you know how uh, candy corn is pointed looks just like shark teeth, and the shark teeth are just about that small. So I use candy corn uh, for the shark teeth. Really exciting. And I told everybody, anybody wants the recipe, you're free to use it. And we tasted it, and it wasn't half bad. In fact, it was quite good. And then about a week or two or three weeks later, the phone calls come in, and they say, you know my customer broke his molar on that <laughs> ice cream because those damn little candy corn turned into rocks which I never saw coming. They were as, once you froze them, they were as hard as could be. So mistakes do happen, but hopefully not today. Any questions? Yes. Have I ever made sugar-free desserts in the ice cream? Blasphemy. Right. Yeah, I have, I, have, I have stories for everything. First, let's talk about ice cream and sugar-free. You can't make a sugar-free ice cream because the dairy product itself has sugar in it. Not cane sugar, but I don't know what the term is, so I'll call it cow sugar. Milk has got sugar in it naturally from the cow. So you can never make a sugar-free ice cream. You can make a no sugar added ice cream, uh, which they sell, Breyers does a job on it. If you ever taste it, it's awful. So um, 14 years ago, 15 years ago, I'm dating uh, Paula and uh, with the intent to get her to marry me. And her father was New York Police Department, NYPD. How are we looking? We got time. Okay. And, um, Keep talking. <laughs> so I figure I'm gonna get the old man to like me. You know, I better, he's got a gun. And um, so I, uh, I would bring him some of my ice creams, you know, high sugar cookies, all the works. He wouldn't eat them. No, nope, I only eat Breyers, no sugar added. Well, I can't compete with that. And then one day I'm watching him with his Briar's No Sugar Added. He pulls it out of the freezer. He scoops out the Briar's No Sugar Added, nice amount, puts it into a bowl, um, and then proceeds to go back into the refrigerator and pull out uh, Hershey's Butterscotch Sauce and pour half the bottle all over it. So much for the No Sugar Added. He's just poured all that uh, sugary Hershey syrup. So the best you could do is no sugar added, and why bother? Because we're not selling a dietetic product. We're selling a frozen dessert. You know, come back and see me when you're off your diet. That's, that's the, really, that's the concept. I mean, if you're running a steakhouse, you know, we're, we're not gonna sell you, you know, the cheapest cut. We're gonna sell you something great. As far as Italian ice, it can be done. However, you have to use a modified sugar called multidextrin. And multidextrin has a nasty, it's a chemical. It has a nasty little habit of if you buy a bag of chocolate cookies that are sugar free and it says multidextrin, it has little tiny writing that says, do not eat more than one or two of these at a time. Well, that's not gonna stop me, I ate the whole bag. And I found out why it says that because it gives you just incredibly bad diarrhea. Multidextrin does. So you can sell multidextrin made Italian ice but your customers aren't ever coming back. So take my attitude, you know, I'm glad you're on a diet, but when you break a diet, you're not gonna go out and say, I haven't had beef in six months, I'm gonna go get a McDonald's Big Mac. No, you're going to Ruth Chris, and you're gonna get yourself a real good filet, the 16 ounce filet mignon, half the cow. 
So that's what we're selling. What is your opinion? Uh, you know I don't sell it. No, because you're selling a treat. High calorie, high fat ice cream. Yeah, which has its place. It's dessert. It's, <laughs> yes. Ah, we're going to make that after lunch. Uh, uh, I'm going to make a uh, coconut-based uh, ice cream, which used to be called vegan, but uh, I contend that vegan doesn't sell. Vegan sounds like an 89-year-old man who weighs 88 pounds, and you just want to buy him a steak because he looks so awful. When my father hit 97, my mother was deciding that he should be like Ruth in the Bible and live to 140. So she started feeding him lettuce leaves and, and stuff like that. And uh, in the meantime, he's got his stash of cookies and candies and Hershey bars down in the trunk of his car in the retirement community. And he'd go like this, he'd say, uh, Evelyn, I gotta go down to my car, I can't find my glasses. Ted, they're on top of your head. Oh no, those are the wrong ones, I gotta go down to the car. So when my sister and I took his car away from him so he wouldn't drive into the Bronx from Connecticut, he wasn't mad at me for stealing the car, he was mad that I took his stash <laughs> of, of stuff. But nowadays, we can do uh, coconuts and uh, just, just a wonderful product, you'll see. So Are we don't call it vegan, we call it dairy free. Yes. Okay. Am I gonna just throw these in whole or break them? Well, I broke most of them. Oh, okay. So here we go, if you can see that on the camera. We're gonna just throw in some cookies as Jeff brings it out, and I have to be as fast as him. Now you can do this yourself, you don't need two people. Uh, you would actually stop, the, uh, cut off the flow, and um, just stir it a little bit. Yeah, squeeze and break them, that's it. This is going to be very creamy because of the cream cheese. Okay, that sounds good. And you saw how all that came out in about 30 seconds. That's what we're aiming for when we make ice cream. It's not good to take two or three minutes. Now, I poured the cookie dust in there. If this was Oreo cookie ice cream, I wouldn't pour the cookie dust in because everybody from New York would know it's dirt. Right? Of course it is. Or cigarette ash. So, but the, the vanilla wafers, you can get away with it. And that's it. Come on up and try it. Anybody getting sick of eating ice cream yet? You, you will. Okay, spread some of these out. Oh, Mr. Spencer, this is good. Yep. Whoa. The banana taste is great. It's, it's good. Yeah, it's got a. This one. Yeah. It's got a Sorry. good flavor. <laughs> Sorry, the cream cheese makes it. I want to start yeah. to put cream cheese in. I've never done that before. Got to be good. Wow. And not, it didn't take much. No, one bar. In your batch, it would be four bars. <laughs> yeah. Jack, you want to try this? Oh no, you, ought to, you really should try this. Come on. Hey, now. he's holding up for the key line. <laughs> Our control board operator is Jack. He's hiding in that back room, pushing all the dials and everything. He makes Jeff look younger and me thinner. I know, I know. That was a small portion. You need more than that. He wants small portion. No. No. <laughs> um, we only added sugar to this because the, the person who made it said it tends to freeze up in the freezer if you don't add a little more sugar. It could be his mix. I don't know. Um, I'd have to try it without it, but I like the taste of this. What do you think, Giselle? Good? Good. That's the cream. Oh, boy. It's as quiet it's as if everybody's having winner. dinner. Good. 
bananas are nice. Bananas are great. And imagine if they were more ripe, they'd be even better. Yes? Can you go over the cost basis of the mix? Like how many gallons, two gallons? Whatever. You, you'd know it better because I get everything for free. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go take care of this. <laughs> uh, the mix generally, you know, depends on which state you live in, of course, Guam. <coughs> but the mix is going to run at about $45 a box. A box has two bladders in it. Each bladder is five, uh, two and a half, two and a half gallons. What is it? Ten quarts, two and a half gallons, which will make probably six gallons of ice cream. So, it'll cost you. Uh, you want to break it down further? Okay. 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 So, so the um, the cookies, right? This is an ice cream that you have to eat immediately, or the cookies will stay. No, this girl, she's going to put it in the freezer right now. And he's going to be eating it all week. The, I don't think there is an ice cream that you can't freeze and serve tomorrow and next week. I don't know. I'll let you know tomorrow. What are you, a scientist? Actually, I am. Yeah. I know. <laughs> the, uh, the profit in the business is off the charts, right, guys? I mean, we, we went down to the pennies yesterday in class, and the, the profit is, is uh, there's nothing else like it in the earth. Nothing else. And you don't have a bigger customer base on the whole planet than you do with ice cream. So if you figure you got 7 billion people who are your customers, and you're going to make more profit than any other product, that's it. That's what I said. Sign me up. And, and I've made uh, 50,000 gallons of ice cream as of now. And... Uh, you talk about the profit on each gallon. You know, cost you six dollars, you make sixty. Fifty thousand, let's see, you know? So it's it's good stuff. This is good ice cream. You know what makes this really good? Is the cream cheese. It was just saying it almost gives you like a tart flavor that cuts the banana a little bit, so this is really good. Mm-hmm. Cream cheese. I was telling somebody else, these machines for some reason, they make a very creamy product. Why do your machines make a creamier product than anyone else? It's because of the design of the Dasher. Uh, we're getting much more scraping action. They have little tiny scrapers, and we have these big, massive blocks that are going around. Before we had massive blocks, we had uh, massive, long uh, metal knives. So we've already right, scraped the whole right. barrel right. instead of little segments. Right. Remember, every batch freezer in the world is based on this machine because we have the original patents. But it's, it comes out much creamier than anything else. Yeah. Even the, the commercial company, Working Cow, mm -hmm. makes great ice cream because of they use your machine. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, that's, it's amazing. that's homemade ice cream. I mean, you can eat, I can't say it on, t on TV here, right? What? Uh, other companies. You can eat. Oh, you can say any name you want. Okay, you can eat. We're blue, like cable TV. We're not restricted. Bluebell ice cream and and those type ice creams, Hershey's ice cream, they're yeah. nowhere near this creamy. No, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> let's have some more ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Do you need more mix? Yeah. I need five quarts. When we get down to the last flavor, we're gonna say, "Hey, you want to make some ice cream?" <laughs> no, no, no more. No, they'll be doing this. No, no. <laughs> Another bag. Uh-oh. That's nothing. It's a broker. Yeah, he says sell, sell. <laughs> uh, so um, I was telling Brian, I think, that it took me six years to come up with vanilla ice cream. I make 40 flavors in my store. We sell 40 flavors. And I've been open for eight years. And we vary the flavors, seasonal and, and specials and all that. But... 
but I was never able to come up with a great vanilla ice cream. And vanilla is the test of ice cream. If you can't make vanilla, you can't. The other stuff's easy. You can add tons of cherries and make cherry ice cream and tons of chocolate and make chocolate ice cream. But vanilla is bare. There's no, you're not putting anything in there. So to make a great vanilla ice cream, I was stymied. Me, the great Jeff, was stymied. The That's great weird. Jeff. <laughs> Somebody, nobody laughed. They, uh, well, I did. <laughs> so then uh, a friend of ours, uh, Rod Oranger, came up. He owns I Rice and Company. And he exactly on it. But well, he's, he important. he's an important person. Okay. He came up, I guess he came up with it or the, I don't know. Probably him, yeah. He came up with a product. And uh, other places make it, but he really makes it. And uh, he sent me a, a free one, which I love. <laughs> and, uh, and I tried it. And we're going to have it today. And uh, uh, it's, it's an amazing addition, and it makes a great vanilla ice cream. Plus, I use his expensive free vanilla, so you can't miss. <laughs> and there's really only... Uh, There's only mixed vanilla and this stuff. What this is, I guess he would want me to show it, right? Sure. This is called Bavarian base. Bavarian base. And the reason this makes it so good is that the, uh, the ingredients, the first ingredient are pasteurized egg yolks. So that's what makes this ice cream so good. Uh, Plus the mix that comes from, we get our mix in, in Florida from two places. Uh, the one Steve uses and I use in my store is over in St. Petersburg. It's called Dairy Mix. And they make a heck of a mix. So we'll try this. It's so simple. It's almost, uh, it's almost embarrassing. Not quite, but almost embarrassing. Uh, in this machine... This is a 12-quart machine, so we'll use five quarts of mix. In the store, I have a 24-quart machine, same footprint as this, just the barrel's larger, and I use 10 quarts. I do that so that this is a batch. I don't have to measure anything, and that's, that's a benefit. I didn't always have a 24. I had a 6, where you have to measure the amount. Uh, but in mine, I just take a bag and throw it in. What could be simpler? But here we're going to have to measure half of this. So that's five quarts. And that's it. Put some vanilla in now. Try not to wince when he pours that vanilla in. Steve. I don't even look anymore. <laughs> I mean, what, what what can I say? I I, I don't pay for it. <laughs> so. About five ounces. I usually add uh, an ounce per quart. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll add this stuff. How much was in that can? How much was what? Never mind. Okay. Okay. 
somebody at the break asked about buying the ice cream rather than making the ice cream. Uh, you still make a ton of money, uh, but look at the fun we're having. <laughs> um, okay, we're, we're, ready. we're ready. Is anybody else too cold besides Giselle? You're freezing. I'll warm it up a little bit. Well, not too much. Not too much. Giselle, I can call in so Sammy. She can sit on your lap. That's it. Pretty simple. As we talked about yesterday, when you first start in your business, ice cream, ices, cream ice, whatever you're doing, you'll, you'll come up with flavors that have a lot of ingredients because it's fun. You know, you'll make a chocolate cake and you'll say, well, let's put the that. chocolate cake in and then we'll put some chips. How about some caramel too? And then we might add a little sugar because it wasn't really sweet enough. And then maybe we should put some cherries, make it like German chocolate. And then a year from then, your husband will say, hey, let's make that German chocolate ice cream. And you'll say, man, let's just make chocolate. <laughs> because it's, uh, what, how did we discuss, discuss that? Um, it's too much work, right? <laughs> it's too much work. It's fun in the beginning. And after 30,000 gallons, cherries and sugar and caramel and cake and geez so but i still come up with flavors every week different flavors because that's the fun and that's the art of it right <laughs> you don't know what i said all right uh, any questions or no but i just want to show something mechanical if i if i can Ooh, go for it um can I use you for a second? Yeah. Um, if you've got... Careful, he's a scientist. A scientist, okay. Um, when you make ice cream, or when you use a machine, uh, any kind of machine, you have to cool the engine, what we call the compressor. And you either cool it by passing air over it, like this one, or by circulating water around it, like this one. Uh, this one is going to generate heat, but not a whole lot because it's a countertop. Um, and uh, this one can be built either uh, water-cooled, circulating water, or uh, air-cooled. Uh, one advantage of the water-cooled, besides not putting any heat in the room, is it's really self-diagnosing. The water comes in at tap water temperature and then circulates around the compressor and goes back out again at about 108 degrees. Now, 108 degrees is warm, but it's not really warm enough to want to take a shower in. Uh, so that's an easy way to judge it. So if you call up and you've had a machine for 20 years and all of a sudden today uh, the compressor is shutting off, we're going to ask you to do this simple test, which I'm going to have you do. If you'll go over to the sink where Jeff is, you'll see the water coming out on the right-hand side and just feel that. It's warm, right? Okay, that means that everything on the machine is running perfectly. If that was hot, uh, I would suspect that the water was, the valve on the wall, not the machine, was partially turned down. Uh, or what happens, thank you very much, that's all he needed. Um, if we roll this, he did a great job. If we roll this machine out, uh, and, and this is why we're so accessible at Emory Thompson, because we've heard everything. Um, what does the uh, insurance company farmers say? that uh, we, know a, we, we know a little bit because we've seen a little bit. Uh, we know a lot because uh, someone might call up and they say, oh, the water's not coming out of the machine. Well, we might ask a question, not something mechanical, but we'd just say, did you clean behind the machine last night? Oh yeah, we got this great company, they come in at three in the morning, we're not there. They move everything, they move the tables, they move the freezers and they clean everything and they put it back. Well, let's see if when they rolled this back, maybe they rolled it onto the, the flexible water line and it squeezed off the water supply. So there's no water cooling the machine. So there's nothing wrong with the compressor, there's nothing wrong with the expansion valve. You don't need a repairman to come in, though we have them on call. You just move the machine about one inch and now you're not on the water line anymore. It, it's that simple. When you build machines for 113 years, well, not me, I'm not 113, but uh, I've been doing it for about 45. But when you build machines that long, you hear the same things over and over again and it makes this machinery very, very simple to diagnose. I've had people call up and ask me to diagnose their tailors and capigianis and I have no trouble doing it 
because the principle, the actual how to do it, is pretty much the same. So just a little something to know about uh, a very simple piece of machinery. I think they're all falling asleep <laughs> they're now. They're sugared out. They were so excited before. <laughs> We wore them out. <laughs> they were so excited before. Now, actually, you are a very good crowd. We've been up here sometimes, and Jeff comes over and whispers to me. He goes, you think they're all dead? <laughs> no, you guys are a good group. No, the... Uh, the advantage of air or water, it's a really good question. Okay, so we're here in Florida, if you're watching, and uh, so we live and die on air conditioning. We need air conditioning. This machine is not generating a lot of heat at a two horsepower compressor. This at three horsepower is almost quadruple the amount of heat that it's putting out if it was air cooled. So this room right now is set at 73 degrees. If it's an air cooled machine, I'm not using any water, so I'm saving on my water bill, but my room just went up 10 degrees in the last hour. And so now the air conditioning had to kick in. Air conditioning is fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is uh, oil, and, uh, and the price of uh, oil and electricity go up about four times a year. Your water bill is expensive. Whether you're in Alaska, New York, uh, Maui, it doesn't matter. We know your water bill is expensive and your sewer is expensive too but it goes up pennies a year compared to your electricity, which every time you get a new electric bill, they've announced a new uh, increase in the bill. When you've got a machine that lasts for 40 years, uh, a water-cooled machine is gonna be far less expensive to run than an air-cooled. So I'd say on these bigger models, we're about 90% water-cooled, 10% air. And the 10% are air are because they're in Los Angeles and there's water restrictions. You're on the island of Jamaica where there is no water and they count on rainwater uh, to drink. Uh, or uh, you're um, in Saudi Arabia and it's not practical <laughs> to even find water. So unless there are restrictions or the impossibility of fine water, a water cooled is, is an easier way to go. They both make ice cream in the same amount of time. The uh, air cooled machine has a third more moving parts so it costs $1,000 more to buy. So when someone says to me, oh, I want to buy an air-cooled because I had to pay the plumber to come in and run the water line, the garden hose. It's a garden hose connection. I say, yeah, but you got $1,000 to play with. I mean, you ought to be able to find a plumber who can run you a simple line over to the sink for 1000 bucks. So if you're buying smaller machines, air-cooled. If you're buying larger, usually water-cooled. You've never looked at your water bill. Who cares? It's a cost of doing business. Right. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't matter. Any questions? We can answer questions about any aspect of the business. Or we can make them up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. What do you say? <laughs> can you put that in English? He's asking about overrun. Oh, okay, I heard something about batch consolidation. What reduces your overrun? When you have overrun, you can notice that the amount of production goes down. Okay, I can answer that easily. What That's, was the question? What is overrun? No, I don't think he's asking that. Well, it's, it's basically the same thing. Okay. First off, the definition of overrun, the word overrun. Let's get rid of the word overrun and use proof, as in alcohol, as in rum. If you have a 100 proof bottle of rum, it's 50% alcohol and 50% other stuff. And they call that 100 proof. But if you analyzed it, it's only 50% alcohol. So if we have a 100 proof vanilla ice cream, it's 50% dairy and 50% air. My father was called down in the late 1950s to a Senate subcommittee hearing because Senator Foghorn Langhorn said, uh, sir, I, I, sir, I understand that uh, you're cheating the public. You're putting air into the ice cream. And my father said, well, yeah, if you didn't have air, it would taste like lead. So air is a normal component of ice cream. Uh, people say, well, I want, it. I want ice cream with no air in it. Well, if you take the ice cream mix or just water 
and put it into ice cube trays. You're so young, you probably don't know what an ice cube tray is. Uh, if you put the water into an ice cube tray and freeze it, you know the, the uh, ice cubes crown over? The normal wow. expansion of water is 17%. 17% in proof would be 34% uh, proof or 34% overrun. So um, homemade ice cream is normally 100 proof or 100 proof overrun uh, or 100% overrun. It is half dairy and half air. I think the best way to look at it, because people will again say, oh, I don't want any air in my ice cream. Well, fine. What are we trying to make? Let's put it on the birthday cakes. Uh, you know what a birthday cake tastes like. A birthday cake would be 100% overrun, lots of air. A pound cake would be a low overrun, 40% air. And they're both good, they're both cakes, but which would you rather eat a second piece of? Uh, a birthday cake or Aunt Martha's pound cake, which is going to sit like lead in your stomach. And then you can take it one further to a dense brownie. Okay, which is really heavy. Sure. And they're delicious, but you can only eat a small amount. Right. So when we go to serve um, ice cream, 100% overrun, 100 proof, four ounces is going to fill this bowl and look really nice. Uh, a 40% overrun, haagen they're actually 45, is going to look very small. It's going to be very dense, kind of like nuclear waste. It's really uh, tight. How can you compare uh, haagen to nuclear waste? <laughs> uh, but it's, it's a very small, heavy amount of ice cream. That's why there's no haagen stores anymore. There might be one or two. They're dead. They just don't know it. Um, it doesn't sell well because four ounces of haagen which is a great ice cream. I love it. We put them in business falls into the lower third of the, the uh, cone. It's so dense. And people eat with their eyes. They want the ice cream falling off. Well, you'd have to give them 10 or 12 ounces of haagen to be falling off the cone. And it would, when they did have stores open, they were serving these small portions, and you would see half-eaten cones in the trash outside the store. It was good ice cream, but it was so heavy, you couldn't finish it, so you threw it out. And it had the heat outside, to the 16% butter fat, can't eat it at all. Yeah, just too much. Too much. So uh, air is an important component, but if you want to make it simple, and so what my machine does, my infinite overrun control, that was my whole invention, is we're all at 100% overrun, gelato was all at 50, 55% overrun, and that's all you could make. Um, with the invention of the infinite overrun, I can start at 100% and I can go down to about 35 percent, uh, which is just around what freezing ice cubes would be. Uh, so virtually no uh, air caused by the agitation. So we can give you anything you want. But the fact of the matter is, if you go up to Jeff's place and you eat ice cream, nobody has ever walked out of his store and said, that's the best darn air content I ever ate. Or, man, I love his uh, butterfat content. Nobody says that. They say, wow, his mint chip is really minty. We eat taste. We eat the whole package. Uh, more minty than yours. More minty than mine. And we eat the finished product and say that's great. We don't break it down into air content. You tell me what you want, I'll tell you how to make it. If you tell me you want the densest mint chip on earth, the machine will do it. But will it sell? No, it won't. Uh, if you want to sell it to a restaurant, now this is 100% overrun, and I think you'll find this very delicious. And even this product will change after we freeze it. It'll have, I contend, it'll have more flavor. It might be just, Jeff says no, it might be just because it's going to be served colder. Uh, right now, I would consider it warm compared to what we're going to serve it to you after it's been frozen for six hours. Yeah. Fat content. The federal government says in order for this product to be ice cream, it's got to be a minimum of 10%. Below 10%, when I was growing up, it was legally called ice milk. Today, ice milk isn't a term. It's called gelato or yogurt or anything else you want to call it because there's no federal terms for those. Come on up and try this, and then I'll just finish off after that. That looks good. What this is, is French vanilla. Okay. Why don't we name it Steve's Vanilla? Okay. <laughs> um, in France, by the way, by law, the law states 
that ice cream, if it's called ice cream, must contain eggs. It must contain what? Eggs. Wow, I didn't know By that. Law? By law. I didn't know that. If you call it ice cream in France, it has to contain eggs. Chip. Yeah, but I don't have it made. here. Uh -huh. I didn't. I was like, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And, and I knew it had to be your dashes. Like, I love those dashes. Yeah, it's a, it's a design we've had for a long time. Over the years. Well, it just. I just wore it's, out my last. Right, right. right. My, my most recent White Mountain gave up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where I came from. Well, they make them still. Yeah, <laughs> But it, it makes a, it makes. Still a, make these? We don't, but the the company does. Yeah. White Mountain, they're owned by uh, oh, rival. Right. They stink. Yeah. yeah. I'm they're, not happy. With them. No, they're very inexpensive. But the problem is with the old salt and ice machine is it takes 40 minutes, and that makes a very granular ice cream. Mm -hmm. By freezing in eight minutes, we're a much smoother product. Mm. We have experimented with making ice cream even as fast as four minutes, and it had a, a negative effect. It, it just didn't bring out the flavor. It froze too quickly. F good. Finishing up on the uh, butter fat, um, if you buy whole milk in the supermarket, it's 4% fat. Uh, if you buy low-fat milk, which we have right over here, it's 2% fat. Now, if you've ever tasted side-by-side -side whole milk to low-fat milk, there's a world of difference. I mean, they're completely different products, and yet it's only a 2% change. So uh, if I go from 10% to 12%, I have, in theory, gone up dramatically. 12 to 14, 14 to 16. Haagen-Dazs and Ben and & Jerry are 16% fat. Um, the higher the fat, the more uh, prone you're going to be in a hot climate like Florida here to uh, step outside in 90 degrees with 98% with humidity, and you've taken in this fat, just like you've gone to Ruth Christ and had a big steak, you're going to start sweating, and you're going to start having a stomach ache because the body can't take that fat with the heat. So I came down to Florida here 13 years ago, and I thought, wow, why are there so few ice cream parlors compared to New England? And the reason is they were all run by New Englanders, and they came down with what I call our hot, high-fat mentality. 14, 16, 17% fat. And the product didn't sell because it made everybody feel awful. The ones who were excess, successful, uh, like a Jackson's ice cream in Dania, he came down in 1950, he was running a much lower fat, realizing that in this weather you couldn't take it. So if you're in a hot climate like Arizona or Florida or Texas, I'll run 10%, the federal minimum. If I'm in New York, I'm back up to, 50, I'm, I'm back up to 16%. And sometimes I even wonder why, because if Jeff was selling 14% in Midtown Manhattan, I'd sell 16, not because I think it's better, but I want the bragging rights that I have the richest, fattest ice cream in all of New York. It doesn't always make it better. Again, we're selling a balanced product, proper air to proper fat to proper flavor. And the key is still the flavor. If you look at the ice, if you taste the ice cream and say, great, hey, that's great, what is it? You know, we failed, we're wrong. So um, the machinery really doesn't have, the machinery can give you anything that you want, thanks to my infinite overrun control. But from a practical standpoint, you have to sell what sells. Anybody else? Oh, that is good, Jeff. Combine them if you want. It is just pouring outside. Okay. Oh, we're going to break for lunch. <laughs> that is lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have lunch for you. Boy, that's uh, <coughs> rich and thick and creamy. It's delicious. It sure is. And you're wearing something on your mustache. Oh, Save boy. it for later. For later. You got it. So Boy, we're going to uh, bring in lunch.
and we'll break for a while, give you a chance to stretch and to get ready for more ice cream. Everybody do a hundred sit-ups now. <laughs> yeah. When I make rum raisin, I only get four and a half out of it. Okay. Why's that? I don't know. How? Oh. They're heavy as hell too. Uh-huh. Right? We made rum raisin, we got four and a half. <laughs> oh, that's why. Okay. <laughs> Two gallons? This guy must be nuts. <laughs> I sell two different types of things. I sell a, adult ice cream and I sell regular ice cream. In the regular ice cream, the biggest selling flavor is chocolate velvet and vanilla chip. Well, all, they're all, I don't know, the vanilla caramel praline and butter pecan are real big, too. We sell those out every week, those two, every week. Um, you mean you adult? You mean with alcohol? Yeah, the adult side, uh, Kahlua fudge and uh, Mystic Slide and Bailey's. Those are the three. Hey, what is this, an interrogation here? <laughs> Man, you're starting. Whoa, look at the time. Um, what are you going to do? Taste that? Yeah. Really? I want to see what it tastes like. It's delicious. It's, it's key lime pie. How good is that? Oh, I could just eat the whole can. Right, of course. You just chill it down. That's it. Put me so, on a beach. So I'm good to go. You take this, add it to the mix, throw some sugar in. Oh, I do add a little key lime juice. Okay. Look at this, Paula. Jeff's going to make key lime ice cream. Two cans of Duncan Hines Key Lime Cream, uh, some Key, key lime, lime Juice, juice Italian 80% full. And sugar. How much sugar? How much what? How much sugar? Uh, 36 ounces, I think, but I only need half because we're making a half batch. Okay. So I need... Uh, 24 ounces. Uh, no, no, 18. Uh, 18. Okay. 18 ounces of sugar. They'll be here shortly with Okay. It. Did Aaron go out, Paula? Okay, thanks. While we're waiting for some sugar to arrive for Jeff's next flavor, any questions that we can tell you about? Answer for you? Nothing? Yes, this gentleman wants... By the way, I think that leaks. Not severely, but uh, it leaks. It will be severe soon. Well, it must be something you're doing wrong. No, it came that way. <laughs> you, uh, who had a question? This gentleman had a question. Go ahead, ask me a question. Yeah. Operational costs. I would buy one of these, um, but in the 24 quart version, not the 12, because as we mentioned before, this makes six quarts, half a tub. That makes a full tub, and the next size up, same physical machine, deeper barrel, for only two thousand dollars more, makes not one tub but two tubs. Oh, that, so, that's the acquisition. Eighty-two cents every twelve minutes. <laughs> In other words, we don't know. It depends on your electric cost. But if you can run a machine that makes four times as much as this in the same amount of time, obviously your electricity You'll is going to be, be a so lot lower. You'll be so busy counting money and going to the bank to deposit it, you won't have time to worry about that. <laughs> on that is, you know, people say, can I make a half batch uh, or uh, how long can I store it? The simple question is, if I make bubble gum licorice ice cream and it sits for six months in that freezer cabinet, what does that tell you? Is, is the question, is the question, uh, is it good after six months or is that such a lousy flavor that nobody wants to buy it? If you're not going through your flavors at a fast rate, relook at your flavors. I make coffee banana. I love coffee banana. Everybody else in the world hates coffee banana because the coffee's fighting with the banana for world dominance. So I make it on purpose because all six gallons are mine. <laughs> but I couldn't sell it to save my life. So um, if you go into business thinking, okay, this is what I need and this is what I'm, what I'm going to be in business, I can understand that, uh, that you buy this machine to get going and you work with 
a chest freezer when I know later on you're going to need uh, different uh, upgraded equipment or uh, more equipment because you've got to get into business what you can afford. Um, and I got to tell you about an email I just got a second ago. Um, so you're going to need the 24 quart sometime. But if you don't have the money for it, don't spend it because you're no good to yourself if you go into business broke. If you don't have $8,000 cash in the bank to meet your bills, because no one's going to give you open account at the start. And whatever you're expecting to happen, uh, it's going to be something different. Uh, so one you, of the rationales was, okay, when you get the machine, and we just started, we were excited, we're going to be experimenting a lot. And experimenting takes, takes a long time, of course. But you need to do it so you can decide which flavor you have. If you have two of the little one, you can have one to do and another one experimenting. See, I don't agree with your basic no. premise. Uh, at all. I do not agree with this idea of, well, we're going to do a lot of experimenting. experimenting. You know, it's really pretty simple. First off, what, what flavors are we going to sell? Well, let's look at the national average. The number one flavor is vanilla. The number two flavor is actually salted caramel. Uh, number three is chocolate. Four is strawberry. There's four of your flavors right there that you know you're going to make. I can't imagine not selling Oreo cookie or cookie monster. Uh, Oreo cookie is just Oreo cookies. Cookie Monster is a bag of chocolate, uh, a bag of Oreo cookies, a bag of chocolate chip cookies, some Hershey syrup, and some chocolate chips. Kids love it. So now we've got five flavors uh, already set, and we haven't even made one thing. Uh, then we go to Jeff's book, and we look at and see uh, whatever he says is the most popular at his store, and we uh, value his opinion. So we're going to pick up two or three more right there. So we're probably up to eight flavors now, and we've never even made anything. Uh, and then uh, the rest, we can look at our market and say, okay, this is a very foo-foo market, uh, Westchester County, New York, where I'm from, and everybody's just totally full of themselves. They're all bankers and everything else. And so we're going to make um, uh, avocado ice cream. You couldn't sell avocado ice cream in Brooksville except to my wife to save your life. I went a full year on six flavors. Yeah. Six flavors. I went a year. And... Uh, mm. And that was pretty good. That was seeing from zero customers up to about 120 customers a night on six flavors. We still sell those six flavors. They're right in that book. Same six flavors. So don't plan on spending months and months uh, experimenting on flavors because it's not necessary. And then when you do want to exp so don't buy equipment based on what you want to experiment on. Uh, then there comes down to actually making the flavor. If you said to me, Steve, in order for you to survive the day, you must make a uh, vanilla birthday cake. I've never made a birthday cake in my life, but I'm going to go pick up The Joy of Cooking or Betty Crocker's book, and it's going to say, mathematically, you need this amount of flour, sugar, and water for it to be a birthday cake. And then we recommend you use this many ounces of vanilla. I like it stronger, like Jeff, so I'm going to add more vanilla. So now I've got my starting point, and I put it all together, and boom, i got a birthday cake. Or I've got key lime pie ice cream. And then on the second batch, you say, you know, it was pretty good, like we said this morning on the mint chip. That was a great example. The next time we make mint chip, we're going to know to at least take the flavor up by a third or more because it wasn't strong enough. The color was nice. That's fine. We'll leave that alone. The mix level was good, but the flavor wasn't there. So we're going to add some more flavor, or maybe we're going to look for an alternative. Uh, Jeff uses creme de menthe, which would be pretty cool. Um, so in the second, we know what the first batch tasted like. The second batch, we can adjust it. And then by the third batch, it's fine-tuned, and now it's in our repertoire. That didn't even take two hours. So you don't want to spend. I got an email. I, I just feel so bad for this lady. I just got an email a couple of minutes ago. And she's telling me how she's got phase one and phase two of getting into business. And phase one is to experiment with her flavors, and then phase two will be to go find a store. Well, in phase one, uh, she went out and bought a uh, $2,000 tank, 30-gallon tank, because she thinks she's going to pasteurize her mix. But she didn't know she needed a motor, and she needs temperature controls. She needs all sorts of things. That's the first problem. Then the person who sold her the tank said, um, uh, I know where you can get a, a Chinese batch freezer that's uh, 20 <laughs> liters for $800. Uh, 
And so she bought it, and it arrived, and it's not 20 liters, it's 2 liters. And it doesn't run because it's on 50 hertz, not 60 hertz. It'll run in China, not here. So she's just lost 800 bucks. And her question to me is, do you know where I can get a cheap Emory Thompson? And I wrote her back, and I said, you, you might as well just tear this email up now because you're going to hate me. I mean, you're going to hate me with a passion. Please don't write back with all sorts of foul words. I'm too used to it. I say them myself. And what I wrote her was, you are not ready to get into business. If you bought an $800 Chinese machine and you can't even move from that standpoint because you don't have any more money, you're not ready to go into business because you don't even have the money to go buy that can of uh, flavor or that bag of sugar. You're stuck. And the best thing I can offer you is not a cheap Emory Thompson, which doesn't exist, or, and there's no cheap Capigiani and no cheap Taylor. The best I can offer you is save your money. Go do something else and save your money. Keep your dream and you'll reach it, but you've got to get more money in the bank before you even open. Uh, Jeff has brought down the cost of getting into business dramatically in my mind, and I, I work on that premise. We, we get you going and you make a lot of money on this, and then you go into the larger machines later. But if you start with almost no money, you have no chance of getting into business. Yeah, I mean, you gotta have something. It's like saying, I'm gonna start a moving company, but all I have is a bicycle. <laughs> you know, you, you can take some small jobs. But anyway, I, so I wouldn't buy two. I would buy one because that's what's affordable. And I know darn well, because it's human nature, you're gonna want a second store. And um, people say, well, I'm gonna buy, it happens very rarely, nobody gives up an Emory Thompson, ever. But they buy this, and I know that every time I sell one of these, I have automatically just sold one of those. So I'm set for the next 40 years. I'm, I'm golden for 40 years. But uh, they call up and they say, uh, I'm going to buy the 24 quart and I'm going to sell off my 6 quart. And I said, let me tell you, the day you put this on eBay, it'll sell in an hour and a half, and it'll sell for 1000 less you bought it for, even though you've had it for three years. But the day you sell that is the day your best friend walks into the store and says, I just found a location 20 miles away. It's only 500 square feet. It's absolutely perfect for a small store. Let's move the little guy up there so we don't have to ship ice cream. And then we'll put the, the bigger Emory Thompson at the mother store. And that, that happens almost every time because it's human nature, it's ego. We want to open that second store. Except for Jeff. And Jeff has gone from... 300 square feet to, I think, about 37,000 square feet uh, with his own uh, gym and health club and swimming pool. And he, he, just, he just keeps adding on to the place. I said, so how are you doing in that 300 square feet? Oh, you mean the 37,000 square feet? <laughs> Isn't that right? With a little Actually, bit of exaggeration? I went, I went from, I started uh, in a room that was nine feet by seven feet. Uh, <laughs> 63, I, 630 square feet. No, how much? Nine sevens is 63, 630 square feet. That's pretty small. 630 square feet? Huh? Nine times seven? Nine sevens is 63. Or is that 63 square feet? 63 well, square feet. And yeah, was that's a, not even a closet. And it was the closet. back room of a gym. You had to walk through a gym, a smelly, sweaty, noisy gym to get to my room in the back. My sink was a nine inch sink, you saw it. My sink was a nine inch sink. And that's where I started in business. And then I kept expanding till I knocked the gym out. And now we have 3,800 square feet. That's a, that's a mansion, to put it in perspective. 3,800 square feet is a big mansion of a house. Yes. Well, Yeah, there is, because it'll, uh, the question is, can you make four quarts in a 24 quart? No, you can't, because you're, you've got so much refrigeration, it's going to freeze to the wall. You can make a half batch. Uh, I have to say, the 24 quart machine is a 20 quart if you're making ice cream, because that's the way the mix comes. And it's 24 quarts if you're making Italian ice, because we're mixing it at the sink and we're just using tap water, so we can go for the capacity of the machine. Like Jeff pointed out earlier, I base, he bases his finished capacity on the way the mix comes. So for today, he divided the bag in half. Normally, he just puts a whole bag in. You can only make a half batch. So if a half batch, minimum, if a regular batch is 20 quarts, you can make a 10 quart batch finished. Uh, so that's five quarts of mix in. You can't go lower than that or it all freezes to the walls. 
You're up. Your what? sugar's here. I'm ready to make ice cream? All right, yeah. Okay. Look at this rain. I'm going to build an ark. We need uh, nothing. <laughs> of course, if I build an ark, it'll be all stainless steel and it'll sink because of its own weight. <laughs> so we need, this is going to be a half batch. Uh, why is it a half batch? Let's see if you're paying any attention. Why do I use a half batch now? Who said that? Okay. You can have the book for it. <laughs> Because this, this is a 12-quart, uh, a and mine is a 24. My recipes are based on 24, which would be a full bag. So we're going to use a half bag. Uh, what's left in here? What did you take out of this? We don't know. I don't know. Okay. Um, Jeff keeps his uh, recipes very close to the vest, which is a way of saying he's not going to tell you. Um, however... I think I uh, would be remiss if I didn't mention it. He has a book called uh, Mystic Ice Cream Original Recipes that he sells. If you're watching this and you're interested, these are great recipes. Uh, every one of them is perfect. Um, you can get this from Jeff. His address is x is is uh, x hippie at aol.com. But you got to watch the spelling because. You know, he's, you know, from Here the 60s. Here you know, we back go. In the, in the 60s, they all did acid and all sorts of stuff. So the spelling went out the window. 60s. And uh, 50s. So uh, the spelling is X-H-I-P-P-E-E. -E. X, the letter X, H-I-P-P-E-E -E at AOL. Can you believe it? He's on AOL. The last person, <laughs> last person on earth. You're on AOL. It's time to move. Um, so I recommend that highly. It's, it's really good. And one thing about me, just so you know, because I've been recommending today companies for dipping cabinets, companies for a flavor, company for this. Both Jeff and I have uh, the same attitude towards recommending things. We do it because we want you to succeed and we want you to have the best. Neither one of us takes a dime from any company. We don't need to, but we especially don't take it because you can't be an honest broker of information if you're going to be taking a, a kickback here and a kickback there. Uh, here a kickback, there a kickback. Uh, we're not going to do it. Uh, so, uh, when we tell you someone, it's going to be a, an honest reason that it's the best you can get. This and is all wet. Does it matter? Well, try it. Let's see. <laughs> Sugar. 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 What happened to the sugar? Right here. Oh and, oh, and should I throw in, for every book you buy, you can have a selfie with Sammy, uh, my golden retriever. She'll stand next to it. <laughs> but we're not here to sell books. Well. Well, maybe you are. <laughs> so we need uh, how much sugar? If you, uh, some of you got the book already. This is in the book, the key lime ice cream. For the other people, oh well. <laughs> Uh, sugar, we need ounces. <laughs> I'll just measure out in the ounces right now. 24. 24. Uh, we need 18 ounces of sugar. They're not writing anyway. <laughs> well, they're all going to buy your book. Yeah. Wait a minute. This is not. We need pounds. Where's the other deal here? Oh, you keep pushing tear, or um, it, it will switch. Uh, units. Sorry, over here, units. I need 18 ounces. There, that's ounces, right? No, that's kilograms. See. <laughs> Neither can I. That's pounds, so that's going to give you pounds and ounces. Pounds, so, okay. ounces. So I need 18 ounces. You got one pound, two that's ounces. too much, right? Yes. Okay. All right, that's good enough. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I guess this would... Um, have you watched the videos where we use the... Uh, 
where we use the, uh, it's the teacher in me, uh, the, the paint thinner, the, uh, the, what, the paint thinning tool, right? Yeah. That we're not supposed to talk about. But that's what I would normally use here uh, to mix this and these. What Jeff's t talking about is he <coughs> took a Black & Decker drill and went to the paint store and bought a stirring rod and attached the two together, and that's his, you know, $400 uh, blender uh, for $49.95. Does it work? You bet. And it was $3.82 for that. This thing cost me a little bit more. <laughs> I bought that. I still haven't used it yet. I bought the whole kit like you have. Yes. Haven't used it yet. Oh. Okay, so we'll add a couple cans of this key lime pie stuff. What was that? <laughs> uh. Now this is Duncan Hines key lime, original key lime cream. That's pretty easy. And it's delicious right out of the can. <laughs> all right. Um, also, what I found in creating all these recipes is that a little Key West lime juice works good. So I'm going to add some Key West lime juice. We'll add one ounces. Let me see. It calls for one ounces. Is that, in a, is that a Talenti container filled up 80% of the way? Yeah. Okay. But we're not adding all of it. Oh, you're getting tricky. Uh, ounces. Got it. Let's go to... There we go. 12 ounces. We don't have to add this to this. And now we'll, uh, we'll stir it up. Or as they say in the song, steer it up. Right? Steer it up. I never got that. Why isn't it? It's spelled stir, S-T-I-R. Can you put this part in there? Because the thing doesn't reach the bottom. Uh, I can get it's you an called an immersion blender. Yeah, I can so get you an extension. <laughs> if he goes zap and the lights go out, we'll know you can't do it. <laughs> now, if you wanted to, could you add a brick of that Philly cream cheese to this? Yes. Damn right. Sure. Sure. That's the fun part that we were talking about. And I, I will, when I go back to the store and I make this again, I'm going to add some Philly cream cheese to it. I wasn't sweetly satisfied enough last time. What was in here before? The vanilla. We're okay. The vanilla. You're good to go. All right. Oh boy, that's a lot of stuff here. Does anybody own a uh, brightly colored Volkswagen Beetle? Oh, because it just went on. floating by. <laughs> it's floating away? <laughs> it went that away. It's heading to the ocean. <laughs> All right, we'll add the 12 ounces of lime juice. Fire it up. <coughs> and should we put it on or mix it a little? Put it on. Put it on. The machine will mix it for you. Right. The machine will mix just, it for you. Just like the sugar, it would mix yeah, it. Yeah, just like the sugar. <laughs> Ain't we got fun? Yes. <laughs> All right. That's it. What could we add to this? Nilla wafers. Yeah, what else? Chocolate chips? Um, what do you use for chocolate chips? I use chocolate chips. I mean, but do they come out hard? I find they work best. Do they come out hard? <laughs> what do I use for chocolate chips? Well, they chips? make special ones that are uh, more on the soft side, like flakes. No, I don't use flakes. I use Hershey's. 
large and small, and now Hershey's Special Dark. Oh, it's it's maybe ten percent more money, but oh boy, it's the Special Dark. You know about that stuff? Wow, Hershey's Special Dark. We we buy the fudge and the chips now. They make in Special Dark, but I use chips and okay. I dump them right in. So do you? Yeah, but uh, someone was telling me about uh, uh, chocolate chip flakes that you could buy, and I just wondered, yeah. do you have a when problem with them being too cream, hard? When you're eating ice cream, when you're eating ice cream with flakes in it, you're never quite satisfied that you're getting enough chocolate, mm. right? You want more chocolate. There's no such thing as too much chocolate. So now some ice creams, I must use the small chips, and some I have to use the big chips. Mm. Go figure. What determines? Me. That's ah. you just uh, that's what I mint chocolate chip, gotta have the small ones. I want chips in every bite. Mm -hmm. The other ones, the big chips, ooh, look, there's a chip, you know. But mint chip, every bite. Okay. Good to know. So what else could you put in here? If you wanted to have fun one rainy day, what? Lime zest. Lime zest? Sure, you could put lime zest in there. Um, could you put strawberries in there? Yeah, absolutely. There's no end to what you can do. That's why you have to limit yourself on the flavors. I could, I could have 100 flavors up on my board, and I have to limit it to 40. You know, it's too much fun. This is too much fun. Do you know of any place that sells key lime, straw, strawberry key lime ice cream? No, but you could. And then people walk out saying, oh, man, strawberry key lime, that's outrageous. So, you know, it's uh, the world is your oyster. <laughs> Something like that. But you can add anything. You just got to learn, and, and it's common sense not to contrast things. And you certainly don't want to put something in that will fight the flavor that you're working with. Oh, hold down the questions. Hmm? Cookie butter. Shh. <laughs> Yesterday, we decided what to make as a flavor that nobody's made before. So the class came up with s'mores. They came up with two. One was tiramisu, and one was s'mores. Tiramisu, we were sitting at lunch yesterday, so all we had was the afternoon left of the class. The class is two days. So all we had was the, the afternoon, and we thought, can we get mascarpone cheese, which is what tiramisu is, at Publix? And we said, nah, that ain't gonna happen. Not the amount we wanted and the type we, so we decided to go with s'mores. S'mores, three things, graham cracker, chocolate, and marshmallow and then you melt it over the campfire or whatever, or you're in a hurry, you just need it right away. So, genius over there in the corner, we, I said, all right, let's go to Publix, and then I said, oh, how much graham crackers are we gonna need? You need a lot of graham crackers, because that's a, a key ingredient in it, in the flavor. So, how much, and what do we get? So we decided, he said, how about cookie butter? You know what cookie butter is? You know what peanut butter is? Just do this. Okay. Peanut butter is in the jars, and they make that. Trader Joe's came up with this. It's called Speculus, and Trader Joe's invented it. You know the market Trader Joe's, the high-end market. They invented Speculus. It is now, and it comes in a jar, and instead of tasting it, looks just like peanut butter, but instead of tasting it, the taste you get is graham crackers. It's, or biscotti, same thing. It is now, I just read online, it's Trader Joe's number one selling item in the whole store, Speculus. So uh, Tim volunteered to take Mandy and go to Publix, and they said, how much should we get? I said, buy every jar they got of cookie butter, and then we needed, and then we had the, um, the chocolate I had at the store, 
and now we needed um, marshmallow. So marshmallow fluff in the jars, vile stuff. But I said, buy all they got. So we get back to the store, and we ha here I go again with stories. It's, <laughs> see, you created this story. So we lined up all the stuff, and then we have to figure out how to make a recipe. You don't want to make a recipe in the beginning by using your machine as the test of a recipe. You want to be able to make it on your counter in a small quantity, taste it, know that it's right, then multiply, do your math, and know what you've got to put in the machine. And that's what we did. Uh, and it worked flawlessly, didn't it? I mean, flawlessly. Uh, we decided that we needed five jars, 14.1 ounce jars of cookie butter, three, oh, we weren't, we weren't just gonna throw it all in the machine. We were gonna make a variegate of the marshmallow. You know what a variegate is? It's the swirls that you see in the ice cream. Very cool. I'm good at that. So we decided, <laughs> it came out perfect. So we decided to make a variegate of marshmallow fluff in the cookie butter ice cream. So we put the cookie butter ice cream uh, mix in the, uh, in the batch freezer. And then we took the fluff and poured it in a flexible container. And it was so thick that we had to thin it out. And which one of you suggested the mix? One of you, you did. He said, thin it out with some mix. Took some vanilla mix, the white mix. We thinned it out with a whisk or, oh no, the drill bit. <laughs> we used the drill bit. We used the paint thinner. Right, we used the paint thinner and boy, that gave the paint thinner a workout, didn't it? That was, that was a long time coming. But we got it to the consistency of, uh, what? Jelly. jelly. Yeah, consistency of jelly. So that when we extracted the... Uh... Hang on. We got work to do. So that when we got the, where were we? Right, so we put all the ice cream in a big bucket like this. And we brought it over to the counter. That's the graham cracker ice cream. And then we took the bucket with the marshmallow fluff mixture in it that was nice and jelly-like, poured it on the top, took a big spatula and turned it a few times, squeezed the tub and poured it into our buckets and we got oh, gorgeous that was beautiful and that we made that yesterday afternoon and today we'll sell it tonight I think it's going to go like that oh boy you want to eat some ice cream don't you <laughs> well I guess we're ready to roll how do you know when it's ready when it holds a peak in here. In other words, it comes down, and right now it's holding the peak. It's not going into the mixture. So I know it's ready. Now, I sh now interestingly enough, some of the people that I taught, because there's a special uh, Facebook site where they all talk, all the hundreds of people who've gone through my class, and one of them, this is crazy, said, Oh, I hope she's not watching. She said, how long do you fluff your ice cream? <laughs> Took me a minute to understand what she meant. This is what she meant. We're fluffing it now. And I'm not going to fluff it, but she fluffs it so that she gets another 10, 15, maybe 20% volume out of it. Why? Why? Why would you do that? Just do it now. Look at that. That's key lime ice cream. Oh, baby. You don't want any. I'm at a disadvantage here.
What? I figured I'd help you set up the table. Oh, the thanks. Uh, oh. Cut bowls we need. That's oh, all. Here. Bowls we got. We got bowls. Yeah. How is it? I don't know. I didn't taste it. Oh. It's the first one I didn't taste. Okay. It looks nice. It's white. Okay, should we try it? I guess we should try it. Let's. I'll try it first. I'll let you know. Wait, I'll let you know whether to come up or not. I'll try second. Oh boy, you can come up. <laughs> How else? No, no, don't, is that? don't come up. Don't come up. We're saving is it all for me. We're keeping it all for me. <laughs> that's good. Oh, that's really good. You asked what you could put in that. And uh, the lady here said um, the cookies, the Nilla wafers. Nilla wafers, yeah. I think some kind of crunch in there would be good. Well, then that's what you make. Yes. I'll keep it like this. Okay. <laughs> it's good. Well, I better go get my third and final formula. Mr. Speculus. Oh, yeah. Look at the texture of this stuff. Unbelievable, isn't it? These machines make such smooth ice cream. That's why I don't think you need gelato, who's ever the gelato people there. I don't think you need gelato. Gelato, you're limiting your market. And you couldn't tell the difference. No, not at all. Make your gelato flavors, but make them in ice cream. Here you go, my man. Good. <laughs> yeah, take a little. He's been waiting a long time for yeah. this. Thank you, sir. Here you go. Appreciate it. And you can come Thank back you. for seconds. And thirds and fourths and fifths. Jeff, what's your biggest fail? No. My biggest fail? Slambuka. I made ice cream out of Sambuca. And uh, that was my biggest failure. Everybody, by the way, this is Giselle. If I didn't, uh, did I mention before that you were here? Yes. Oh, no. Giselle is uh, uh, new to Emory Thompson. She's going to head up our international desk. So if you're in Mozambique and want to speak to someone from Emory Thompson, you'll be speaking to Giselle. Got to. You could never make peach. Before they leave the stuff, I have a woman show giving their receipt. Okay. Um, everybody stop by Crystal's office. She's the last office on the way out on the right, and she'll give you the receipt back for uh, your attending here today. And thank you all very much for coming. We had a fun time. Yeah, we always do. <laughs> we enjoy it. Thank so thank you. <laughs> I don't know. It might hurt my back. <laughs> <laughs> the bowing days are Yeah, over. they're gone. <laughs> no curtsies either. No. <laughs> but I don't know with that car you're driving. All right, so if anybody would like a tour of the factory, we'll take you around. All right, good Thank luck. You. Good to I see you. I love this. Thanks for coming. It. I really appreciate it. Brian, what did yeah. you think of that? Actually, it was good. I thought it was, uh, I was a little surprised. You little You're welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thanks, You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, man. You kind of shook me, but I, I really appreciate the thoughts. Yes. Oh, Unless you want to keep working for a living. I think you want to stop working for a living and start having fun. Um, your electrician is going to take the cord.